late, but uh, I thought we could start, so please take your seat and we can start our day. Today we are here to kind of celebrate the Lost Millennials project with a conference, with a high level conference, uh, Western Fund, and we hope to help reimagining of Europe employment policies. My name is Lutza Portai. I'm representing the lead partner at Far Research Institute. Our institute is based in Budapest, and we are a think tank. We do a lot of evaluations on different uh, policies, um, and we believe that evaluation, knowledge, and research can support decision makers, actors, to make better policies and to implement better policies. So I hope this day will help you all to do that, to share the information, research, knowledge we have gathered during this project or other means of our professional life, and to share it with those decision makers, those officials, who are here to represent those who are making the policies, those who are making the policies work in the high levels of the EU and also in our member states, in our cities, in the small villages, in the employment services, in the NGOs, where we met those people who are we here for, the young people of Europe who haven't found a way, neither employment, nor education. So I hope that this day will shed a light to the lost millennials, to those uh, youngsters who are a bit older young people. I'm very happy that young definition is getting broader and broader today. But we will talk about those who are older than 25. They are an often hidden group of young people, but they came to the spotlight of EU policies and also the policies of member states. So today we will hear about uh, their situation, their problems, and we will have some panel discussions. Uh, we will talk about what policies work or what policies could change to make to work it better. And we will talk about special vulnerabilities within this group. We will talk about uh, women, we will talk about gender differences, we will talk about youth with migrant background, those who need more attention, and we will have a panel on the rural-urban divide. And also, at the end, but I think for me that's the most important, one of the most important messages we will talk about evaluation, the results of the last millennial project and the results of other evaluation projects and how evaluation and research can support policy making. Last Millennials project is funded by the Norwegian grant. We are very grateful that uh, the grant saw the potential in our consortium. Our consortium consists of uh, 13 uh, partners, 13 states, countries. So it's a big group of very diverse people. When we first came together, it was, wow, a lot of different people. Yesterday, we found friendships, we found good working relationships, and we wanted to continue. So we are all hope that this is not the last Lost Millennials event in Brussels, but a few years from now, we will meet again and share uh, our experiences again. So thank you very much, and I wish you all a, a fruitful event, some provoking discussions event, and some housekeeping. There is a free Wi-Fi, I think that's one of the important questions everywhere. Uh, it is the guest Wi-Fi, you don't need a password for it, so feel free. And if you have any questions, uh, technical things, we have Blanca here, uh, who can help us in that way. So thank you very much, and we will start today, 
I will uh, give the floor to Alexander Gerganov, director of the sociological program uh, at the Center of, for the Study of Democracy from Bulgaria. Uh, his work is focuses on evaluation and quantitative methods, and I asked him to share his greetings words first. Thank you very much. And I give the floor to Maura Mason, Sector Officer 
um, from the EU Norwegian Grand Transnational Cooperation, Equality, Justice and Decent Work. <laughs> So, dear partners, dear friends, it's a pleasure to be with you today at this event discussing one of the most pressing topics of our time, how can we best empower youth to reach their full potential. This topic is not only close to the ENORI granted, it is also a topic close to my own heart. Um, I have a background from uh, youth affairs and inclusion, and I'm born and raised in Norway, while I'm also half Hungarian. So I know that the challenges we are facing in Europe both are shared within and across borders, youth unemployment being one of them. We at the Norway and Grounds and EA Grounds, we work for a more equal Europe in close collaboration with transnational um, and bilateral actors. Our fund for youth employment contributes with 60.6 million euros, which is supposed to supplement EU funds. Um, to support sustainable and quality youth employment in Europe. And we are very proud supporters of the Lost Millennials project that has gathered us here today with partners from 13 countries. It is truly an initiative that works to find common solutions to share challenges. Because as Mr. Gagelog also mentioned, there uh, is progress in Europe, but there are still challenges, uh, gaps in social and economic development the lack of sustainable quality jobs for youth, social inclusion, exclusion and discrimination are among the threats that youth are facing. And we know that some subgroups of youth are even more vulnerable for exclusion than others. Girls and young women was mentioned, Roma youth, youth with disabilities, rural youth, and young migrants and LGBTI youth are among the groups that are especially vulnerable for exclusion from the labor market. The COVID-19 pandemic has also taken a serious toll on the employment possibilities for Europe's youth and Russia's aggression in Ukraine has forced many young people to fight for their freedom and millions have had to leave their lives behind and flee for safety. Many of them are young women, often with children. These disasters have also affected the European economy in direct and indirect ways, including high inflation with negative impacts on business investment and private uh, consumption, and major hikes in energy and commodity prices, generating a cost of living crisis. In this challenging context, we need to be conscious of how we can build and rebuild our societies. <coughs> From what knowledge bases politicians use in decision making, to what types of data that are gathered during the implementation of these initiatives, and finally, to how these initiatives are evaluated in the end. It means that our efforts with the goal to develop our societies need to be evaluated in a way that makes it possible to learn what works and what doesn't. The Lost Millennials Project is a best practice example in this regard because you work exactly in this intersection between practice, evaluation and policy for the purpose of youth empowerment. One and a half years ago, Norway started negotiations with the EU on a new period of the EEA Norway grants. And the Foreign Minister of Norway has uh, said that we will be firm on our stance concerning inclusion in the beneficiary countries. We cannot spare one single citizen, one single youth, in our efforts to build the Europe that we believe in. Because investing in youth pays off not only metaphorically speaking, but in hard cash. And as I come from the oil nation Norway, I want to put it like this. Youth are the real oil. They are the biggest resources in our societies, and we cannot leave them untapped. Because not unlocking the potential of our youth is a losing game. Not only for the individual youth itself, but for our entire society. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to all the panels today. Thank you very much for your kind of words. And um, I asked Julia Chang and the Stella Water to share one of our results, one of the project results, and share some, share some information by the current characteristics of 25 plus needs 
So, so the tone, what we are talking about today. So I'm not quite sure, um, as I was listening to the other two speakers, I was thinking, mm -hmm, so what are we going to present them, say everything that, <laughs> that is included in our report, but um, I think it's important to kind of put everything together in a sense, so thank you for already kind of starting the action, uh, both of you, and I'm now so, hello everyone. Um, yeah, we are going now to present you the characteristics of NEEDS 25 plus and systemic factors that influence them. So actually this presentation is based on a research report which we have written at the beginning of the Los Millennials project together with 13 partners, so thank you for your contrib contribution. And when you are interested in this research report, you can find it at the Los Millennials webpage but also ResearchGate. Because of time, we are now going a little bit more into the characteristics than on the systemic factors. So in case you are interested, please take a look at the report. So some uh, information in regard to the report. So we actually aim to get an overview on the one hand, but um, on the other hand, we wanted to get also comparative perspective, taking into account that 13 pro uh, different uh, countries participated in the project. So we were on the one hand interested to get uh, generalities, to find out similarities between the countries, but on the other hand we were also interested in differences. And talking about differences, we were not just interested in differences on different countries, but we were also interested in differences <coughs> taking into account the needs 25 plus rates. So we actually thought about typology and when taking into account this needs 25 plus rate and classifying the countries according to these needs rates, we found out that Iceland, Malta and Norway has low needs 25 plus rate, that means beneath uh, under 10, whereas Austria, Finland, Czech Republic, Poland and Hungary has a so-called medium <coughs> needs 25 plus rate, that means between 10 and 20, and Romania, uh, sorry, yeah, Romania, Slovakia, Spain, Bulgaria, and Greece has a high needs 25 plus rate, that means um, more than 20. Before I talk a little bit about the data source, for sure, typology is always a simplification and you can also leave things out. However, it enabled us to actually, you know, to find out if it actually there are similarities if we take a look at countries that have a lower 20, needs 25 plus rate. Like, can we find out that the needs in these countries have similar characteristics? Are there specific systemic factors that are implement or influence this need 25 plus rate, positive or negative, that we actually can find out? Talking a little bit about boring things like the sources of our report. So we actually provided the partners with a research template where they actually needed to find out about the characteristics of their needs in their country with this research. A few sure also thought, uh, looked at data sets like Eurostat, Silk, Living Working COVID-19 data set, and especially Eurobarometer. Now we are actually going to talk about five different topics just to give you an insight why we choose these five different topics. So taking a look at all these different um, sources, data sources, we actually found out that there seems to be five very important topics. And they are gender and gender differences, health and disability, rural versus urban, uh, education system and early school living, as well as labor precarity. So these five topics popped up and we actually wanted to take a closer look into these five topics. So our report as well as the presentation is structured across these five, or along these five topics. So I'm going to start with gender and gender differences. So what we found out, that there is a gender gap in needs 25 plus rates countries. So in every country of the consortium, the consortium we found a gender gap. There are more female than male needs. Many needs are young mothers, and we found out that care work is one of the most common reasons for being need. However, it's not the case that the so-called countries with a very high needs 25 plus rate are also the countries that have the highest gender gap. As you can see, uh, countries like, for instance, Greece and Spain, they have, their gender gap isn't that big. 
but comparing it to Malta, where there is a low mean strength of blast rate, we can see that the gender gap is even higher. So what we can see is that if we want to conclude in which kind of countries there is a higher gender gap, we can conclude that the more eastern countries like Czech Republic and Hung like Czech Republic and I think we see Hungary, also Slovakia, that they have actually a higher gender gap. Talking about intersectionality, I'm not sure how much you're familiar with this concept of theory or approach. In academia, we're not sure how we call or how we should define intersectionality, if it's a theory or if it's an approach. But basically, intersectionality enables us to understand that there are multiple discriminations, there are different structures of inequality, and they can intersect. So if we take a look at needs, and we take a look at the person, and the person is female, and the person has a lower formal education, we found out that the chance to become a need and also stay in the status increases. This is, for instance, the case in Malta and in Spain. But this is not just for female person. This is also for male person. So if we take a look at Finland, Austria, and Hungary, we found out that the chance for a person, like when a person is a male, and it has a lower formal education, the chance is higher that the person becomes a need and also stay in this status. But this is also the case when we take a look at mental health issues. So in Norway, for instance, a person who is female and also has mental health issues, the chance is again higher to become a need and also stay in the status. This is also the case for male needs in Austria, Hungary and Poland, if we take a look also on health issues. However, we found also out that for sure also like traditional gender roles present in various milieus, but I'm not sure we can also, I think, conclude or assume that it's not specific milieus. There are traditional gender roles, I would say, across different milieus, but okay, we can for sure also say that in social economic or like disadvantaged people there might be uh, stronger traditional gender roles. However, it's important to recognize that these traditional gender roles, you know, that differentiate between public and private, the woman is more, you know, like in the private sector, or like in the private sector, but in the private sphere, whereas the male is, you know, like more in the public sphere, that this for sure makes a difference and also leads to females to stay at home and becoming a need. However, we also find out that there is still dis discrimination in the labor market, so again, or females again have difficulties to enter the labor market because of discrimination and that also leads to becoming a need and also stay in this status. I'm now handing over to my colleague to talk about health and disability. Thanks, Stella. Um, <laughs> so, um, as Stella said, in a sense we tried to, to form a typology, but what at the end, we figured out um, the group of 25 plus is very heterogeneous, but that these characteristics which we can associate with them, but most times 25 plus meets don't have just one of the characteristics, so they're not just female or they um, don't have, they, it's not that they have health issues, it's a mix, it's a combination of some of the factors. So um, thanks, Stella. So she's already spoken about gender, um, gender and gender issues. And I don't know. Maybe I should um, have a little test for you. From the intersectionality uh, that she spoke about, uh, we saw two aspects that are very important uh, in the form of characteristics of twenty-five plus needs. That's health and disability. So um, this is one of the reasons um, for becoming a need for the 25 plus groups. And also it's particularly important, it's, but it's highlighted for people who don't have access to, to health systems or healthcare. Um, so what we looked at, we looked at how health and how the health status of someone and, and the poverty and social in, how the poverty and social inclusion based on the health status changes. And we can see that the blue lines are, they have some um, health issues. The red one is some to severe and the green ones are severe. So as we can see, if you have the more severe 
disabilities you have or the more severe health issues you have, uh, the more at risk of poverty the people are. So that when we're talking about health and disability, it's not just um, disabilities in general, it's also learning disability, mental health issues, uh, issues related with addiction, um, and so all those things restrict the daily uh, life of the people, and we also um, notice that many people who fall into this category have also unhealthy behaviors, um, which make their health also deteriorate. The other thing, if we notice from the inter intersectionality uh, that she presented was the low education level. So we noticed that um, 25 plus needs tend to have a lower education um, attainment. Most of them have no education or maximum of a lower secondary education. And also, um, these are people who are um, affected by Ireland school. Um, if you look at early school leaving, this can be a whole research topic on its own, but in general, some determinants um, are the degree of urbanization, so whether someone is in the rural area or the urban areas, um, if they belong to an eth ethnic minority, it depends on their social economic status, um, health, and also family related issues. Um, what we, we notice is that there's kind of, in many countries, a mismatch between the curriculum educational curriculum and the labor market demands. So we have this standardized um, testing instead of focusing on, on skills that can be used in the labor market. So at the end, yes, you might have a good education, but you don't have the skills that are required in the labor market and, and there's um, a mismatch. Um, so we had a few um, good examples from Malta and Slovakia where we saw that there are some systems that uh, support children from disadvantaged families, that they invent, uh, invest into teaching staff, um, they offer care services, and of, offer also skills that are not, not just, I don't know, maths or <laughs> biology, so they have transferable skills. So we thought to ourselves, maybe if we redesign uh, the education system in a way that includes also the skills that are transferable to the labor market, we can reduce the early school living rates. And maybe, we don't know yet, maybe it will have an effect on the rates. So, if we're following, <laughs> one of the reasons for being early school leavers was the degree of urbanization. We noticed that most of the 25 plus needs, except for Austria, very strange, are living in rural areas. Um, and in rural areas, we have people, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second, but I'll get back to it. <laughs> so in rural, uh, we have like the difference between rural and urban areas, their rates of unemployment are similar, but uh, most, most times, not always, city dwellers often get more money, uh, more wages. Um, the difference is large between um, what people are in rural areas and what people are in other areas. And also in rural areas, there's a lot of um, inequality with regard to um, what kind of resources there are, healthcare system, education systems, uh, jobs available. And also in many areas in, in Europe, there's a very high rural urban migration. The fifth and the last. <laughs> Um, characteristic is labor precarity and so I would wonder so we're talking about needs not in education um, and training but obviously if you're talking about labor precarity it means that some of the needs are in employment but most of them are not, not not even most of them all of them that we're talking about are not in kind of um, official employment so they work in and the care work um, which is challenging to reach kind of an, in, a, so policies cannot target things that are not declared or that are not there for the public. So if you're working under the table, how a policymaker is supposed to, to kind of target these areas. 
And it also means that even the numbers we get about the rates of needs is mismatched or is not very accurate because some of them are still in employment or they're in employment but not legal or um, over the table employment. So we count them as needs whereas they're in employment. So we kind of have to find a, a solution there. And the other uh, reason for needs is the temporary work. So many of them are seasonal workers, and when the season is over, they become needs. Um, floating needs are an interesting part. I think I had them from the Nordic countries. So these are kind of a university, people who want to go to university, <coughs> I think it was in Finland, where there are these entry exams, which are really hard, so people take time to kind of learn <coughs> for them to enter university. So in this state, they are needs. But then you ask yourself, um, this kind of need and the need who is low educated, um, has health issues, um, strange or strained family um, relationships, if it's the same kind of need. So it, it's very, very different. Um, so the, the, the reason also for, for needs is that there is high unemployment and very few jobs, or there are very few jobs that kind of fit with the skills. So this is one of the reasons why some people can't find employment, because there are no jobs, or there are no jobs that they are qualified for. Um, we checked on the impact of the pandemic right at the beginning, so when COVID was still a thing, it's so, not a thing anymore, but still a thing, not a thing, so um, our colleagues from Poland uh, did a deep analysis on the impact of COVID, uh, but we noticed that also um, in the beginning of the COVID period that many people uh, lost their jobs, so they fell into this category, um, and this was also in particular for countries with high levels of rates. So Stella, do you want to do the final? Yes, I think so. We, every one of us got an overview, hopefully. Um, I think what is easy to recognize is that when we talk about needs 25 plus, we talk about a very heterogeneous group. So there it doesn't exist the needs 25 plus. It's different, like there are some needs that have chronic health issues or health problems, others are young mothers. And based on that, it's very important to acknowledge that, they are, that this is a heterogeneous group and to understand that these heterogeneous group, that they have different needs and face different challenges. So for some measures that take into account and maintain the health are important, whereas for others specific or systemic support during parental leave is important. This typology which I explained to you at the beginning actually help us find out that if we take a look at countries with a low 25 plus needs rate, Malta, Iceland, Iceland, and Norway, we found out that the needs are mostly young people who cannot participate in the labor market or education due to their health condition. When we take a look to countries with a high 25 plus needs rate, Spain, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, Greece, we found out that needs are predominantly healthy, but they suffer from the structure and dynamics of local regional labor markets. So when we take a look at, for instance, the financial crisis in 2008 and the influence of the financial crisis and also on COVID, we found out that needs in these countries were more affected by the economic fallout in relation to the crisis. Therefore, it's super important if we face a lot of grand challenges and there will come new crises, to really take care of especially this needs group in these countries. So we actually want to thank all the partners for yeah, the help for to this that we could actually finalize this report and yeah, that we had the possibility to work with you. And yeah, we're looking forward to connect with you and network and share ideas and results. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. We will continue with the first panel uh, on 25 plus needs labor market integration and policies, policy of work, policy experiences. So I'd like the panelists to come up to the stage.
and thank you for all of you that you are here and happy to discuss with me the issues of policies. First technical thing, we have some mics. You can hear. I'm not very good with it, so it has to be very close and you have to turn it on before using and turn it off after using. So we need to talk to the mics that everyone could hear us and please a sign if you don't hear us. So first of all, our panel. Sevar uh, Finbogason from, from the Bifrost University, from our, one of our uh, donor partners, will help me as a rapporteur of the panel. And we have our panelists here, Lilia Yakuba from the Center uh, for the Study of Democracy, uh, Lily works on projects related to ethnic minorities and vulnerable groups at CSD's sociological program. So her uh, interest areas include the marginalized population, social justice, and policy for social change. So thank you for being with here. Uh, we also have Esther Suni from the Hitler Research Institute. She is the head of the program, the project manager. She has a background from sociology, and her key research interest is youth and education. And we also have uh, Jeroen Jutte from the European Social Fund Plus. He is the head of the coordinating unit uh, of the European Social Fund in, in the DG Employment, Employment for Social Affairs and Inclusion, Director General. Uh, but he was previously led the unit for Bulgaria and Romania and worked on the employment and social aspects of the European semester. So thank you very much for being here. And first I will turn to Lilia. And uh, the Los Millennials project has produced a transnational policy note. So all of our countries were working on producing national policy recommendations and Lily and her team were uh, contributing a, a transnational policy note. Uh, this is a very important and also relevant output of the project. So please, can you present the transnational policy note in a nutshell, very shortly? Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> hello everyone, it's great to be here. And we have a presentation. Yes, we Should have a short presentation of a couple of slides. Yeah, you can just read the first slide. So yes, so this transnational policy note is uh, basically a product of uh, um, the work of uh, the beneficiary partners. So nine countries, uh, and I'll mention the countries, uh, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Greece, Hungary, Malta, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, and Spain. Uh, and I'll be very brief, uh, I'll present a couple of the major uh, things that we uh, developed in this note. So first we touched on policy challenges regarding 25 plus needs policies. And then we also touched on uh, recommendations. So hopefully uh, this analysis will be helpful not just to national policymakers but to EU policymakers. I think I will not be mentioning anything new. Um, some of the problems are continuous problems, uh, and some of them were actually already mentioned in the presentation before um, from our colleagues in Austria. So main policy challenges which we uh, identified across these nine countries. The heterogeneity uh, challenge, and uh, as you can guess, this is about uh, the types of people, the subgroups, uh, which are included in the 25 plus needs general category. So we are seeing um, a variety of um, people in this category, people with health challenges, people from uh, different ethnic minorities. Um, we are seeing people uh, of different gender. So what we notice with policies is that uh, across these countries, um, policies are more general. They're not targeting uh, a specific subgroup. So they're more like umbrella policies. Um, and this is problematic because as, as marked by our colleagues uh, before, um, these subgroups have their specific challenges uh, and they need specific approaches uh, to address them. And I mean subgroups, yeah. 
Then um, a second major um, problem we noticed with policy starting from 25 plus leads, uh, we call them more generally policy complexities. Uh, and one of these complexities concerned outreach. So uh, we noticed that there are policies targeting these uh, young people, but oftentimes these policies do not reach them. Uh, in a lot of cases, these people need to register with the labor offices, but oftentimes they're not registered with the labor offices. So there is no way for institutions to know who these people are. Oftentimes they're hidden groups, so it's a challenge to identify them. Yeah. Um, another issue concerning this more general category of policy complexities concerns content deficits. So policies may exist, but there may be lacking very, very important aspects of these policies, such as, for example, in Romania, I remember the colleagues um, noticed that the prevention aspect is missing. Or, uh, for example, in the Bulgarian context, we may have um, policies focusing on apprenticeship and training opportunities or providing short-term employment, but long-term employment opportunities are kind of missing. And this is actually what needs need uh, long-term employment. And then some insight from our colleagues in Spain, which uh, we found interesting, concerns funding dependencies and this over-reliance on EU funds. And it's wonderful that the EU is supporting our countries, but um, uh, our colleagues raised the issue of local political will and national political will. Um, where are the national actors uh, in the creation of the policies, in, the, in giving initiative and encouraging uh, such policies to exist, versus having an actor from above and saying, you need to do something about it. And then the third bigger challenge we identified concerns evaluations. So uh, we noticed that evaluations are present, but the extent to which they're comprehensive, um, not so much. Um, so certainly uh, all these countries can do uh, more about policy evaluations. And then the next slide with the recommendations, I'll just go briefly over it. Yes, so. One of the recommendations concerns uh, the need to focus on subgroups in uh, policy creation and policy uh, implementation. Uh, then the other policy recommendation is the need to reinforce and enhance interinstitutional partnerships and intersectoral partnerships. So not just policy making at the level of institutions responsible for policy making, but also NGO sector, the inclusion of uh, different um, sectors of policy making, for example, the health sector to be included is also very important, not just ministries of labor and social policy. So a wider range of actors to be included in decision making, in policy creation, policy implementation, and also evaluation. The gap between education and work, um, even though initiatives exist um, about this, the gap is still present. So what we see is low education and people cannot find work, but we also see high education and people still cannot find work. So there is there are apparently discrepancies between what is happening with the education systems and uh, what the labor market is looking for. And finally, the need for in impact assessments, more of them to be implemented. And not just that, but um, there needs to be an understanding that there are benefits to policy evaluation. They're not just there to criticize policymakers that they didn't do something, but they can be seen as something that uh, is constructive and that can help us uh, outline some directions for the future. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Esther? <laughs> Uh, you, you've been leading the last millennial project from the beginning. Um, can you highlight some of the national findings, some what we found interesting policy measures or the success stories which can be, um, which we can learn from? Um, a lot of also the examples and the, the practices I collected uh, were mentioned by uh, by the league, just also coming from a general perspective, 
when we analyzed uh, the policy context of the different countries, uh, we overall found, as Lee mentioned, that the EU has a great influence uh, on the policy areas uh, concerning 25 plus needs, especially uh, employment policies, um, and um, uh, especially also considering the youth guarantee, which now with the reinforced youth guarantee includes uh, the 25 plus uh, age group. Um, and uh, we also found, not surprisingly, that the, the different countries with the different uh, policy structures, the way they implement policies that address or uh, impact 25 plus needs is different, or the way they do it is different. So for example, in Hungary, which is a rather centralized system, uh, the employment measures are implemented through the main operational programs, um, while, for example, in Spain, uh, there are more uh, local plans uh, addressing you specifically, so then it also comes to question how much you can address uh, the specifics of needs and the local uh, needs or respond to the needs of the local labor markets if you um, come from a more uh, centralized uh, perspective. Um, there are also different aspects that were mentioned in the previous presentation, so work-life reconciliations and gender issues, uh, how much you have specific policies relating to these specific issues, uh, even if they're not concerned with you specifically. So uh, there are actually quite a few uh, countries with specific policies addressing uh, gender issues or the gender gap uh, among youth. Um, so for example, the Czech Republic, Romania, and Spain have these kind of very specific um, strategies for this. Um, and we also found that there are in most countries some um, incentives um, or incentive regulation, um, subsidized rates um, of salary costs or predefined subsidies, for example, in Malta, Romania, Poland, or social security costs. So there, this exists in most of the analyzed countries. Uh, and also we found that uh, there is orient related to orientation, so career guidance also exists. Uh, through public employment services in most of the countries, uh, but it, as it was mentioned, it might not reach the necessary uh, people, so those who are not uh, registered. And regarding a specific example, I want to go a bit more into detail into the Maltese case that was mentioned in the presentation. Uh, as uh, mentioned early, school leaving is one of the key risk factors uh, for uh, becoming needs, and Malta was successful in reducing um, the early school leaving rate from 33% to 11% uh, from their accession to the EU until uh, 2021. And what they did is that uh, they introduced a complex system of a variety of measures. So um, they, they focused on new teaching methods and provided teachers with the necessary trainings to be able to implement these methods and focus on inclusive education. Um, they also provided supplementary tuition and additional teaching assisted positions for uh, those who are most at risk of uh, early school leaving and those also with learning challenges. So they really provided additional efforts and resources to prevent those who are most at risk to, uh, of, of dropping out. Uh, they also provided educational and career guidance, not only in job centers, but also in schools. So they focus on early uh, career guidance as well, uh, and um, they also so they, they also involve the employment services in assisting assisting students and job seekers to not only uh, gain uh, technical or vocational skills, but focusing more on uh, transferable skills and soft skills that are in demand um, at the labor market. And from these very specific measures, they also place more emphasis on early school leaving and inclusive education on a higher policy level. Uh, so they introduced um, strategies for inclusive education and for tackling early school leaving. And in addition, I, I forgot to mention this, that they also introduced a migrant learning unit as uh, in Malta, uh, which has one of the highest rates of immigration uh, to the country, they provided special uh, assistance and courses for uh, migrant learners to be able to integrate, learn the language, and, and be part of mainstream education, so to prevent them uh, from uh, dropping out. Thank you. Let me move to you, Um 
you're working all in with EU policies. So can you share some thoughts about how the European Social Fund can support and what, what are the, the main changes um, and protections? Thank you. I, I said that to be listening uh, up to now, and uh, I have to say, <laughs> we think alike, right? Mm -hmm. but, but I will get there in a moment. So uh, thank you for inviting us. And it is really a sympathetic project uh, on a very important issue, because uh, it's true, of course. It's, it's, it's a cliche, but the youth is our future. And so it's very important to make sure that uh, also in their professional life, they start right and often uh, we have seen that in the past and that's why the youth guarantee is there you know we accompany young uh, persons throughout their educational uh, career let's say whether that's uh, up to the end of secondary school or vocational education or university and then they're left alone and then there's this gap right <clears throat> and for some the gap is not a problem but for many it is and so the youth guarantee and, and addressing the issues surrounding needs is really about you know, making a bridge, getting rid of the gap. And, and that is what we try to do also with the European Social Fund. So the European Social Fund is by, large, uh, by far the largest uh, financial instrument in support of people in Europe. And for the current period up to the end of 27, is 142 billion euro, which is combining European and national money. It's about 100 European and about 40 plus uh, national. And then obviously, a big chunk of this budget should go to youth unemployment um, because it is such a, a vital issue. Um, somebody said investing in youth pays off. And, and we couldn't agree more. This is really almost our motto. Right? Youth unemployment is twice as high as general unemployment, um, and, uh, and obviously the need rate at, at almost 12% is far too high as well. And it has very high cost, and not just for society, not just economically, but also throughout the lifetime of an individual. And it's not just financial cost, it's also social cost, health care issues, and so forth. Yeah. And like the multi example, by the way, very nice one. Low educational attainment, early dropouts is a major driver in this story. It's not the only driver. We've seen gender, we've seen where you are born, where you are raised. It's a big issue and a number of other issues, which social group. Trans generational, intergenerational uh, uh, transmission of property. That's also an important driver. Um, but all these drivers can be broken and we can improve. And we have systematically and significantly improved over years. Uh, but we have not improved enough. Now, the youth guarantee. Uh, is, is our main instrument in the context of the ESF. And, and what is the logic of this uh, youth guarantee? Well, the underpinning is not the money. The underpinning is to make the bridge, to break the gap. And that requires, it, and it came up, that different <coughs> entities nationally or also where appropriate, regionally, locally work together. Public employment service, training entities surrounding educational institutions, Ministry of Education, uh, local uh, administration, social services, and not to forget the social partners, in particular the business side of social partners. I once was visiting uh, a, a, a project in, in Helsinki effect for the youth guarantee, and they did everything great. They had a very low uh, entry barrier kind of location in the city center. It was basically a bar. And then there was a back office where all the kind of services were offered. So you could just get a drink, a coffee, or whatever. But you could also make use of those services. But their biggest problem was actually not so much providing training or channeling people 
into social services or channeling people back into education. The biggest problem was actually get them apprenticeships and such. Right? So that the business community side of it. So anyway, the, the main storyline is that we need a broad approach and that these entities, these services, must talk together so that we can have an integrated service delivery. There goes my speaking voice. <laughs> Without it, I would be lost. <laughs> so anyway, to support that, that bridge building, we have in, in this totality of ESF, we have about a bit over 17 billion euro on the current period. So you, know, really you can do a lot with this. Uh, with this. And, and many things that we do actually doesn't require money. Entities talking together doesn't require money. Right? It doesn't. Except if you have a location like this. It's new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah. We emphasize and we, we put priority on long term and employed. And, um, and uh, a long term inactive. And, and that actually corresponds statistically fairly well to the over 25. Right? Um, and, and that is really a very important thing. Now, we, we, we underline in that context really the, uh, the, uh, the importance of activation measures. Also, the Alma projects, you know, people putting people in a different context, taking them outside of their, their locality. Uh, giving them a new horizon. Horizons give new ideas, new hope, new energy. And we have surprisingly good results, relatively high cost, but, but really quite effective for the, let's say, the more difficult cases, right? So that, that's quite interesting, I find. But beyond that, it's not just about the guarantee, the youth guarantee. If you take Romania, it was mentioned several times, you know, a little bit better than that, some other countries. You know, you need also the, the framework conditions. For example, you need a, a public employment service that's effective. That's why outside of the youth guarantee, we're heavily investing in increasing staffing levels and confidence levels in the public employment service in Romania. That has no common effects. The same goes with social integration pathways. Let's say also in Romania, where we're putting really hundreds and hundreds of millions in strengthening that. Because how do you deal with Roma communities, for example, if you don't have trusted intermediaries, if they don't trust you, if you don't have other parallel social development actions, like you know informal settlement, uh, settlements that are in a way formalized in city planning, so that you can simply have public services like roads, electricity, maybe a post office or, or whatever in those areas, a sewage system. And, and, and that is also very important because your public environment matters. So it's not just about, you must not stare blind on the youth guarantee dimension of the ESF. You need to look at the totality of the context that, uh, that we're trying to address. Now, much like your project, we also do a lot of uh, mutual learning in that. We have a project called Social Innovation Plus, where we bring together uh, uh, stakeholders and practitioners from different countries on their own initiative is very much bottom up. What we do is just pay for it. Um, this is run by the, the Lithuanian Managing Authority on, on behalf of the European so Social Fund Commission and, and bring together uh, uh, member states. And we have actually an upcoming event very soon on the needs, uh, and there's a call open uh, for project proposals in that regard. And, and let me just close with some speaking to long already uh, about with a, a relatively positive message, uh, somehow outside of our control, but I, I do believe that the situation will significantly improve. And this is in part, of course, because all the wonderful things we do, and I, you know, the evaluations that help to improve the things, evaluations should not be seen as a cost, but as an investment, uh, I believe, in data in general. But the societal trend, if you look at that data, are such that things will improve. Demographic decline is already leading today to a massive increase of labor market shortages. And we are just at the start of it. And we better start using all those people that have lots of potential that is not seen, that fall into the gap where we're building the bridge. And, and so, by default, the interest of our economy, of our economic partners, of our businesses and public services, I may add, is to use all we can to be effective in bringing people back.
back to the labor market. And there's an incentive because of this situation to simply invest more in getting those uh, people into jobs, <coughs> into apprenticeships, back into, I would say, a, a socially included environment. So that is, I would think, all good. And that goes for all the groups. Gender, as I mentioned, also people with disabilities or other health issues. And so, forth. so I believe in the next 10 years or so, we'll see a further continued decline, quite significant, even if we would scale down the policy, I believe, as well. Um, but certainly, uh, it is not the intent of the Commission to scale down the policy. Quite to the contrary, skills shortages undermine our capacity to grow. So we need to invest even more in up reskilling, bringing young people that fall between the cracks into the labor market context. So that is the final message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, thank you very much for bringing this to the table. There is another side focusing on the, the growth opportunities of Europe as a whole and how um, use are important in this question and um, how it is important that no one is left behind. Um, the final minutes of this panel, I would like to open the floor if you have questions for the panelists. Don't be shy, don't be that shy. We have one minute for one question. <laughs> so. Social Fund and LRI have some initiatives tackling handicapped work. So, uh, can you elaborate on the impact of these initiatives as you see them? And do you think, uh, how do you see the uh, intersection with the needs and uh,
Let's have a 15 minute coffee break and come back at 11.30. Continue. Yes, say for now. Good. Okay, I, I realize that uh, we are overextended of the time, so I'm not going to say anything much as a back of the but I just wanted to mention though two things that um, strike me. Um, many uh, projects are ongoing. Uh, the social fund is, of course, uh, using huge amounts of money in various different projects and, and so on. And, and I think that what was interesting in what you said earlier is that uh, that the, the we are sort of lacking in, in, in good impact in evaluations. And uh, this is problematic, uh, to say the least. <laughs> so uh, that's one of the benefits of, of doing something like, like this project, uh, this was the Daniel's project, is that it has sort of highlighted these problems and shown us, because as you mentioned, um, I, I forgot which of you mentioned it actually, <laughs> but you pointed out that the policies are often very general. Uh, they don't address the specific challenges of the different groups uh, that in, in each country, or, or not even, even it would be wrong to say in each country, because we, we are talking about in each uh, you know, area because areas in different countries are different, you know, there are different challenges between areas in, in, in some places, rural and urban and so on. So how can we, you know, uh, create mechanisms for better impact the evaluations and how can we uh, get that knowledge across? I think that's what I take from this talk here. Uh, speaking for myself, of course, and nobody else. And so thank you very much for your, uh, all your three talks. Very educational for me, at least. Thank you.
much. So my name is Esther Kosha. I'm a Hungarian social worker and social policy expert living under Kisvata. And I am the thematic expert uh, of the Los Millennials project in Malta. In the last two years, we have done a lot uh, researching the situation of these 25 plus needs, um, looking at policies and initiatives addressing them. Uh, evaluating one concrete project that uh, addresses their needs. Um, it has been very, very learning tool. So very shortly I will talk about vulnerable groups. Um, first of all, to give you a general picture where Malta is and actually where Malta was uh, 10 years ago, you can see the orange uh, columns are the 2012 uh, needs rate in the whole needs uh, population, meaning between 15 and 29. Uh, the blue ones are the data from the needs rate data from 2022, and the green line is the EU target for 2030. So you, you may see that Malta has the third lowest needs rate in the whole needs, needs population uh, among the EU member states, and also that it has achieved this low needs rate with a uh, very impressive um, decreasing uh, of the needs rate uh, in the last 10 years. And it has already achieved or even below the EU target for 2030. Today we will talk about also um, Slovakia and Greece. So you may see that both of them have reduced their needs rate in the last 10 years, but still above uh, the level to be reached by 2030. Um, Malta has very impressive employment related statistics. Even if we talk about youth uh, unemployment, it's very low. We talk about needs rate, it's very low. We talk about activity rate, it's very high. But, uh, and all of them are quantifiably better than the EU average, actually, usually in the top three, to say so. Uh, but these very positive statistics may hide or mask underlying challenges. So not everything is that beautiful as the statistics uh, might present. Uh, first of all, talking about education, Esther uh, already mentioned uh, the early uh, school leaving rate, which was very impressively uh, went down to one third in Malta since the EU accession. So there are very positive trends, but not only that, also uh, participation in higher education, especially for women, has increased in, since the UN accession remarkably. Uh, but although the trends are very positive and very promising, the educational attainment level still falls under uh, below the EU average. And that's only one thing. We talk a lot about adaptability. So the skills and knowledge schools provide not necessarily meet the demands of the labor market. Uh, this is something we recognize in other countries since the demand of the labor market is changing really fast. Um, another very important thing that Malta heavily relies on foreign workforce. Uh, before the COVID, 35% of Malta's resident population was non maltese born. Uh, this has, uh, after the COVID, it has even increased. And especially in the working population, uh, foreigners, uh, migrants are highly, highly present. Um, and when we talk about high employment rate, we have to see that these numbers also cover those who have precarious uh, circumstances, who are not protected, not secured, who paid low, and who do not have decent work. Um, and we also have to recognize that especially young people are at the risk of being in work poor. So while having a job and having social security still being around or under the poverty line. Uh, we have set up a typology of Marty's needs, which I will not go into details of because the time is really uh, limited. It has been told today many times that needs are a very diverse group. It covers people, young people from the top of the society, those who just finished school, taking a gap year, not really knowing what they want to do. They fall into the, to the category of needs because at the moment they are not employed 
or not in educational training. Or it can be people, it's quite typical uh, actually for Malta and I added this category after our policy brief meeting and uh, when our attention was called to this, that highly educated young Maltese people often do not find um, jobs on the Maltese job market that they would think that they really should take uh, regarding salaries. And these are the ones who after a few months leave the country, leave the island. But while they are there and still trying to find the job they dream about, they fall into the needs category. They are the elite, they are on the upper end. But on the other hand, we are talking about migrants, refugees, we are talking about young women, single mothers, or um, uh, not mothers, but young women who have care responsibilities because of what they cannot work. Or we talk about people who are dealing with mental or physical issues. Or we are talking about discouraged young people who might come from a dysfunctional family and do not see their chances to join the education system or the employment market and they are just kind of cordies there, they are kind of lost from the systems. So it's a very diverse group and talking about Malta, since the whole population is very small and the needs rate is very low, we are talking about a very small group itself. If you talk about 25 plus needs, it's super small. It's somewhere between 3,300 and 500. So, I mean, how would policies um, address these uh, people when it's a very small and very diverse group with very different needs? Okay, talking about vulnerable needs, I think it was covered. Um, I don't want to uh, repeat, but the most uh, vulnerable is the ones with disabilities, mental health issues, migrants, especially third country nationals, people who work undeclared or irregular or precarious, and uh, those who have uh, care responsibilities, especially women. The project that we evaluated uh, during the Los Millennials project uh, is called uh, Documentation Equals Employability. It was implemented by the Adidas Foundation, which is basically a human rights foundation, but it was an employability project uh, funded by the European Social Fund. Mm, what they have uh, recognized as the main challenges that sometimes people cannot get the legal employment because their documentation is not proper. 95% they are talking about migrant people, but they can be also LGBTQ uh, people who feel that their documentation doesn't reflect their identity and since it's not proper, they just don't go to any official administrative procedure, uh, including employment. So another thing that most of these people who cannot work because of lacking proper documentation, uh, live in deep poverty and have a lot of issues with uh, housing. They just cannot afford housing. So the two main provisions this project was providing was legal counseling, obviously, to have those proper documentations they need for work, legal working, and the rental subsidy system. Uh, the impact is obviously uh, opportunity to have legal and decent work, decent living conditions, and social inclusion. And I would like to mention that it has an even tangible longer term impact for the next generations because those parents who achieve proper legal status uh, in a new country, uh, it's already um, uh, given to their children as well. So obviously it's a long term impact. So very shortly, uh, that was our finding, uh, or these were the findings uh, concerning vulnerable groups among me in Malta, and we can have further discussions during the panel. Thank you very much. something to the complex puzzle of uh, the issue which we are so thinking about and which we are solving for uh, some time and uh, it's the gender view on the uh, issue of uh, 25, 25 plus, uh, plus needs. Uh, I'm from Czech Republic and as uh, there was already mentioned uh, Czech Republic has the highest gender gap in uh, the needs rates from the whole Europe. 
and uh, I want to elaborate a little bit uh, about the reasons and possible uh, solutions of, of this issue for Czech Republic, but maybe also for other countries. Uh, on this graph, we can see the gender gap and overall need rates for European countries in uh, 2022. Uh, I've highlighted some countries in red. Uh, here uh, on the right side, you can see Malta with uh, almost uh, zero percent uh, gender gap. Uh, in uh, red, you can see also Greece, uh, where the gender gap is slightly higher, but still, still pretty, pretty good. On the other hand, uh, we got uh, countries in uh, black uh, color, uh, and we can see that the gender gaps here are slightly higher in some cases, in case of Romania and Czech Republic, the gender gap is pretty, pretty big. And uh, what uh, does these uh, countries have uh, in common is that uh, these countries are the post-Soviet <laughs> countries. So our uh, uh, idea is that uh, there is some division of the euro based on the post-Soviet or not post-Soviet history. We can see the clear division. The red line represents the historical Iron Curtain. The, in Germany it was obviously different, but uh, it represents the situation. And in the eastern part of the Europe we can see the higher rates of the gender gap. Uh, highest in Romania and Czech Republic. Uh, now let's look uh, deeply to the Czech Republic case. Uh, needs in Czech Republic are divided into a few groups and I've added this table to compare the gender groups but also different age groups uh, by the gender. And uh, at the end we can see the women, females, by age group 15 to 19, 20 to 24, and 25 to 29. And we can see that the highest need rates are between the uh, 25 to 29 uh, members of this group. Why is it so? We believe that uh, it is because of the parental leaves and uh, because of its specificity in Czech Republic. Uh, the specificity comes with the length of the parental leave in Czech Republic. Normally, uh, people go to the parental leave for three years, but it can rise up to four years, which is pretty long time. Uh, another issue is that, uh, and I have it here, that uh, uh, in Czech Republic we don't have a pretty good institute of flexible work arrangements and uh, it needs to be enhanced for the future. Uh, part times and so are not so common in a Czech Republic, uh, normally full time or nothing. So uh, it is something to enhance for the future to tackle this situation. And why is it problematic? It's because of the re-entry to the labor market. With the long parental leave comes the mental health issue, comes the retraining issue, and we can see also the loss of some working habits and so on and so on. Many problems, and uh, these uh, must be tackled. Uh, so, our ideas for possible solution solutions is to uh, integrate uh, is to enhance the programs for the re-entry into the labor market uh, use and promote the part times and other forms of uh, flexible working arrangements and uh, the I think most important point here ensure the sufficient capacity in institutions for kids because uh, in Czech Republic uh, there is a big problem with capacity of these institutions and uh, when uh, parents don't have opportunity to uh, put their kids in some uh, care, otherwise then they need to stay. 
Uh, then there is a rhetorical question. If it makes sense to uh, shorten the parental leave, uh, I believe that the institution of long parental leave in Czech Republic is so common that uh, it is uh, not a good solution, and the solution is to do it by uh, improving the infrastructure for kids and so on. Uh, so, uh, if you will have another questions uh, concerned to this topic, I will be happy to talk about. And Sorry. Uh, for sure. The fourteen thousand five hundred is it per year or for the two years? Sorry, I don't know. The amount of financial support from the government is it for the, the It's the whole period. It's the whole period. So it's not for every year. No, 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 no. It's the whole period. And uh, you will have the same amount if you can choose how long you want to have your parent leave, and by that you then have the monthly payment uh, of this sum, which is the same. Thank you very much. You made a, a piece in the puzzle. I would, uh, I would like to put another piece and to magnify more. And we need to talk in the, in, for another uh, vulnerable target, which is the Roma people. Let's imagine that today we are living in an isolated area in the city. A young uh, person, preferably a woman, 20, 25 years old, what the chances do I have to enter the labor market and not to be excluded from the system? As we can see, the Roma people face a lot, a lot of problems, especially the women. And, and I think we need to, to discuss about it. One out of four people, Roma, uh, age 16 plus, uh, is employed. Only one out of four. And the percentage concerning the women is 60% instead of 34%. Um, and 72% of young Roma women and 55% um, uh, are the rates of this type. So we believe that we should put a lot of effort, a lot of attention in this type. And um, uh, the comparison to the general population is 35% needs rate in the general population compared to, uh, to the Roma people. That means that we should put a lot of attention in this target. For me, one of the problems is the educational system. They face a lot of, a lot of challenges. The cultural norms uh, and expectations that they have uh, early work over the formal education. Only 3%, only 3% of Roma people are going to the university. 3%. And when a person is going to the university, this will, uh, will have the news, uh, will have it on the news, because it's too rare. Discrimination is another challenge that Roma people face. Need. Of course, curricular gaps, and this is something I haven't thought about before. Imagine in our books, in the schools we have in our book, uh, 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 in the books that we have in our schools, do we see Roma people in it? Never. This um, highlights the problems uh, that these people are facing and the challenges that they face in economical situations. Economical constraints, financial barriers, barriers they don't allow kids to go to school, to educational assistance. And uh, of course, language barriers with the other uh, uh, population in different uh, countries. Support deficits and attendance disruptions. Of course, a lot of people in this, uh, uh, a lot of Roma people have to be transferred from one place to another. So this doesn't allow kids to, uh, to attend to the school or to participate the need in one educational program uh, in one city. There are also employment challenges for Roma. Um, this is widespread discrimination, <coughs> high levels of uh, reported discrimination in jobs. We all have heard 
people that take advantage of Roma people when they are working in, in, uh, in, in some uh, jobs. Poor housing, you know, the houses of Roma people usually um, they are living in, in difficult areas, in disadvantaged areas, uh, which impact the social inclusion and, of course, the job opportunities. How many entrepreneurs would like to hire a Roma person? Just a few of them. Lack of basic amenities, a lack, some of them lack of uh, uh, clear water, electricity, and uh, of course, um, uh, the impact of residents and the employment rates uh, are too low, especially in their neighborhoods. When we have to point out more, to, to magnify more on the women, the problem is much, much bigger because they have to play their cultural roles. They have to marry very uh, early. Even from the age of 12 or 13 years old, they are obliged to get married. Uh, double discrimination, of course, being a woman and um, uh, also being uh, in an ethnic group is something that don't give them the opportunity to participate in um, uh, the, the, the labor market. Of course, it, uh, also the gender stereotyping aspects which is uh, common uh, in all Also the barriers for women, women in employment. We see uh, discrimination and skill deficit. The labor market bias, uh, which is coupled with lower skills. And I believe this is the problem, the lower skills, this is a problem of the whole target group of needs. Not general skills. For me, the problem is the digital skills that you need to have uh, in, in the modern society. Imagine that these people need some of, some of these groups, refugees, Roma, uh, migrants, they don't, most of them don't have the digital skills to enter the labor market. And that makes uh, uh, the gap even bigger. And for that reason, I'm not sure that I agree with what I have mentioned in the previous part but the rates of the needs will, will decrease. If we will not put attention to the digital skills of young populations, for sure the labor market will exclude this, uh, these people. But I'm, I'm sure we'll have the, the time to discuss it later on. Of course, Roma women play traditional roles, which is um, limit their uh, education. They have fewer uh, work opportunities. And, um, uh, they don't have bridges to employability, <coughs> and there is a huge bridge gap. That's more or less what we already have found through our research, and which is makes common sense. This is really, really common for that kind of population. And, and the findings are similar not only for Roma people, but also for refugees and, and uh, for migrants. In Greece, recently, there is a, a big initiative. Uh, from uh, 21 to uh, 2021 to 2030, um, it's about empowering women and uh, young Roma in, uh, in social integration empowering them. And the aim of this uh, uh, initiative is to actively include uh, uh, Roma people in the labor market and the rights advocacy. Um, I'm sure and I know that this initiative also will put a lot of emphasis in the entrepreneurial aspects and to enhance entrepreneurial skills of Roma people because this because this is a way out of them to enter the labor market. This is what they have done for ages right now. And um, key action areas, awareness, empowering organizations, which is really important, organizations that helps Roma people, and of course advisory services or counseling them, supporting them, and the, uh, trying to integrate them in the society. This is a, a flagship initiative from, uh, from Greece, and I'm sure we will have the opportunity to discuss more about this uh, topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. All, all of you, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh,
common topic in the presentations uh, for this panel is related to vulnerability. Uh, what would you say is the main factors related to belonging to a vulnerable group in your country? Uh, Esther, you first. Yes, I think most of it has been mentioned. So, uh, but I would like to highlight, since we are talking about young people, the important role of the family, the family background. Um, if the family is dysfunctional, if there is domestic violence uh, or addiction present, if there is no positive role model uh, of uh, having a higher level of education or being employed is something good, this has a huge impact uh, on the young people. So besides all the structural reasons we have mentioned related to education and disabilities uh, and care, um, obligations of the women. I think when we talk about young people, uh, we definitely have to look at the family level as well. Uh, from uh, my point of view, I absolutely agree with uh, what you just said. The family background is uh, very, very important, and also all other mentioned factors play a role uh, in Europe, also in the Czech Republic. Uh, I would again say that uh, Czech Republic specificity comes with the parenthood issue and uh, I will come up with uh, another factors uh, of vulnerability and uh, its connection uh, with the government's actions during the COVID-19 pandemic. When we saw the statistics about unemployment and needs rates it was obvious that the increase in the rates was higher for the population in the age of needs. So it's obvious to, uh, that, that they are most vulnerable also to this uh, economic uh, type of uh, situation, crisis and so on. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic also showed us uh, the vulnerability of young people connected with mental health issues, which is uh, very important. And just look on the numbers of the increasing prevalence of uh, depression, anxiety, etc. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of uh, Czech Republic, uh, the level of education and rural urban divide, it looks like that it doesn't play a significant role. So that's for the chicken. Let's assume that we are almost 25 right now. And <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not. <laughs> and a kid, um, a person of 25 years old, he has a pandemic, as you already mentioned. Before that, a financial economic crisis. Now he has one or two wars in front of him. A society that he believes that he cannot understand, or she cannot uh, understand, and the society cannot understand young people. Of course they are angry. They are angry with us. And what's the problem to be, uh, uh, and, and what do we need to do uh, in order not to be angry, just to include them? Education is something that we are going to mention. The education as if we need to change. That's the first part. We're not preparing people uh, uh, to be happy for the soft skills. We are, we are trying to, to give them the hard skills in, in our school education, except from some countries. But for my country, the educational system needs to change. The structure of the labor market does not help young people to enter because um, uh, the labor market needs more and more and more skills which of course a young person doesn't have these skills and we need to bridge the gap between the educational system and the labor market and the third one especially for, for uh, other minority groups like uh, migrants or refugees language is a big problem it's a huge problem we need to work on it. And we need to work from both sides. We need to make our society more inclusive society to accept the difference, the different uh, 
present from another country. That's probably the most important thing we have to do. Both uh, Wojta and Tassos, uh, you talked about uh, gender in, uh, in your presentations. Uh, can you all elaborate a bit on this for each of the countries? Uh, how is gender division represented in issues regarding needs in your country? Uh, Wojta, will you go first? For oh, sure. Uh, I've already talked about it uh, in my presentation. Uh, just numbers, needs rates uh, between uh, men uh, around 6%, needs rates between women around 17%. Uh, uh, this trend can be seen for a long period of time. I've showed it from the 2015, but we can see it from... from uh, I, I have data from 2007, and I believe that this gender gap will go back to the history. Uh, I believe that I mentioned it a lot in my presentation. Yeah, we most of the topics we already have mentioned during our discussions on the presentation. I would like to emphasize first on the family obligations that the, uh, women have, and this is not very easy to to match the uh, the work balance between. Uh, uh, employment, employability, and uh, the family issues. Uh, this is uh, one factor about the gender division. The second one, which I want to highlight also, is about the differences in entrepreneurship. You know, I think we already have discussed it during the, the break uh, with a colleague from the university. Uh, entrepreneurship is a solution for uh, instead of having, having a pay job, is a solution to be an entrepreneur. And it fits sometimes to the role of the woman um, if she wants to enter the labor market. But the problem is for the needs. Again, our educational systems are not preparing pupil, uh, uh, people, pupils or students for, to, be, to be entrepreneurs. They are preparing them for to be in a paid job. And uh, we need to enhance the skills of women to become entrepreneurs. Uh, and this is the second topic. And the third one, I already mentioned it, is the low digital skills. Comparing women compared to men, they have lower the skills, uh, digital skills uh, to use in a, in a paid job. So this also excludes them from the labor market. So, talking about uh, gender gap among needs in Malta, uh, it is almost zero uh, in the whole uh, needs population between 15 and 29. Uh, I think one of the smallest, right? Okay. And also in the 25 plus population, it is only 3%. And if someone was listening very carefully today, then can we recognize a controversy there? Because uh, in the Austrian ladies' uh, 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 presentation, there was a higher uh, percentage. And I was a little like embarrassed that oh, something is wrong. And then we realized that since that uh, research was done at the beginning of our um, uh, work, that is the 2019 one, where it was over 7%, and now it's 3% in that population. So it also teaches us that it's first to look at trends and not only snapshots per years. Uh, but uh, in 10 years ago, 14% uh, of needs were uh, women. I mean, among women, the needs rate was 14%, but it's um, only seven now. So there is a huge change. And, and what is the reason of the change? I agree that one of the bigger topics is uh, single mothers. So to have single mothers back to the labor market, you have the carrot and you have the stick. The stick is to have a very short maternity leave. You have to go back. In, in Mata, it's 18 weeks. Uh, we could discuss if it's right or wrong, and, and there are a lot of uh, sides of the story. I don't want to go in that, but for sure, that for sure the short maternity leave is 
one of the reasons why women go back to work, because they don't get paid for three, four years. And there is the carrot, which is the childcare. Uh, in, uh, in Malta, there is um, freely accessible, good quality childcare for all working women from the age of three months of the child. This combination seems to work. Um, and why, uh, another reason why uh, the needs rate of women has fallen so drastically, probably, if uh, we have mentioned many times that education and attainment level is a very important factor. The um, participation of women in higher education in 10 years increased from 18% to 31%. Again, maybe we will find them actually if the needs will be an even older category there because they postpone giving birth, I don't know. <laughs> that's just the, you know, just, that's just calculation. But obviously, education, participating, uh, participation in education, childcare, and maternity leave are very important factors. Thank you. Um, in Esther's presentation, she talked about migration as a significant factor related to increased risk of meat status. Uh, so this question goes to Tassa Salvoida. Uh, how much is migration of animal related to need issues uh, in your countries? Uh, I believe that uh, talking about migration nowadays uh, in Europe is uh, even more necessary and interesting if you look at it. Uh, migration is a clear phenomenon in Czech Republic nowadays. It was not so uh, two years before we didn't have uh, such a big problem with migration. We've cared about some uh, domestic migration streams, uh, with the population of some regions, and so on, but these were domestic uh, problems. Nowadays, uh, we have the war uh, on Ukraine, and uh, some numbers connected uh, with this. To the date of 20 November 2023, almost 94,000 men and almost uh, 165,000 women from Ukraine have been granted residence permits in Czech Republic. So there is a big number of uh, people from uh, Ukraine. Uh, we can also see the clear gender division, that, but it's, uh, it's connected with the war reality in Ukraine. And uh, it's a pity that we don't have uh, enough data about these people, we can't say how many of them are needs and uh, the age division goes 0, 15, 15, 18, 18, 65 and uh, more than 65 so it's uh, kind of hard to work with uh, this uh, but uh, <coughs> migration it is a bit topic in nowadays Europe so only in, in your countries, in all countries, migration is a big problem. I remember a few years ago, the war of Syria, with the refugees, not only migrants, and uh, thousands of people were coming, trying to cross the borders, the sea borders, from, from Turkey to the Greek islands, and from the Greek islands to the mainland, and from Greece to, to Germany. You, you could see young people from 18 years old, 30 years old, trying to escape from the war, of course, but our society was not ready and prepared to accept them. Entrepreneurs didn't want them in their job, the majority, of course. When they tried to find a job, they didn't have the legal documents. That was the problem that we was previously mentioned. And when he he managed to find a job. The salary that he had was much lower than the average. Because some, some, not all, the entrepreneur took advantage of that. This is a huge problem. This is exactly the same here with the war in Ukraine um, and, and all the refugee movement that we have right now in Europe. This will not be solved unless these people that are coming to Europe, we could see them as something, as a gift. Because with the low birth rates now in Europe, we need people 
to be with us. We need people to work in the fields. We need people to work in the offices. We need labor for the skilled labor force. And another topic is we need to see how these people, which most of them are highly educated young people, can transfer the skills and the knowledge that they gain in their countries. That's the topic for me uh, about migrants and refugees. And uh, I will uh, add uh, one uh, idea. You mentioned uh, during the break that uh, it is important to realize how easy yeah. one becomes a refugee. May I? <laughs> From second to second. Yeah. Uh, on the 7th of October, it happened for me to be in, uh, in Jerusalem, in Israel. Mm -hmm. The day before, it was a massive festive. Uh, that day started the war. And um, after that, we tried to go to, to the airport. Finally, we managed to go to the airport when the boxers were, uh, were, uh, go, they were in the airport, in, in the parking of the airport. And I realized how easy it is for one people that we can become a refugee from one day to another, from one moment to the other. We can be in their positions. You could see in the airport, thousands of people try to escape and to migrate in another country. This is something that can happen to all of us. That, that's what we were discussing during the break. Yes. Yes. Esther also would like to add something. And also, maybe you have some thoughts also about... Very shortly, yes. Um, um, there, we all experience an increase in xenophobia and anti-migrant uh, political rhetoric in all across Europe. And uh, in Malta, where actually migration is really huge, when Malta uh, joined the EU, the population was around 300,000. Now it is around 530,000. And it's all migration uh, to the country. Uh, after the COVID, it's typically migration from third countries. Um, and there is a controversy that um, the economy builds on the cheap labor force of these people, and on the other hand, doesn't really want to have these people in the country. And I think that's what we all have to face, that we cannot have both uh, rapidly growing economy built on cheap labor, and at the same time uh, being kind of picky about uh, who we want to have in the country. I mean, both ways go, but the two ways don't go together. Uh, in the CASA's uh, presentation, we heard that there are several issues related to the need status among the Roma community. Uh, and I want to ask the two others. Uh, are there issues related to marginalized groups in, uh, in Malta? Uh, and in the, in the Czech Republic. So, Manta is the only EU member state which does not have a Roma inclusion strategy simply because there is no Roma community. But since that's so super so personal, sharing the future Jerusalem uh, experience, I will go a little personal too. I have a Roma husband and such, uh, I have a Roma child. And uh, you mentioned all these um, um, issues regarding Roma discrimination, prejudices, housing segregation, segregation in the educational system and so on. There is another thing I would like to recognize as an um, increasing phenomenon, at least in some countries I know, tokenism. That Roma people are in uh, uh, decision making or high political or administrative uh, positions uh, to tick the box that Roma representation is so, but they are not there to represent the Roma interest, rather to tick the box. And I think it's super dangerous. Any solutions for this? <laughs> the Roma community has to, the I mean, yeah, because they have to kind of uh, uh, bring up or educate those people who are strong enough, educated enough, well-speaking enough to represent their interest, and then 
push them into positions, but it takes it takes time. But it's I think it's the responsibility not only of the majority of the society to accept these people, but also the world community has this responsibility. It's restructuring the society mainly to achieve. Well if you want to change is it oppression, then it is yes. <laughs> Uh, I will try to build on it. Uh, as I mentioned, restrict the levelization of uh, society. Uh, in Czech Republic, there is a Roma community. It's not very strong, but uh, there are some uh, localities where these communities are strong. And uh, I believe that one of the tools to tackle this issue is the inclusion. In education from the early age of kids and I believe that uh, by this maybe in future generations we will see integrated Roma community into the society uh, and that's it. Thank you, I think it's um, time to start to sum up the discussion um, but in the, in the audience today is, uh, is also people working with policy making and decisions. Uh, so if there is two and only two uh, policy recommendations that you would like to share uh, with the policy makers, which two would you like to give? Okay, so we talked a lot about... It's working, right? Sorry. So we talked a lot about uh, mental health issues as, as a, as a uh, very important topic regarding needs and especially we have seen as an impact of the COVID-19 pandemic that young people suffered much more. At this age group, being separated from your peers, from your age group, had an even bigger impact, uh, ending up with depression and suicidal attacks, whatever. So one of the recommendations I would mention to have accessible, good quality and first of all on-time mental health uh, support for all but especially for young people. On-time is very important. It's not something that can delay that, okay, we have free mental health support in six months you'll have an appointment. I mean, it's not a way to go. Um, and the other one is to develop and especially to implement policies and measures against precarious uh, working conditions to have real decent work for all, especially for young people. Uh, my uh, first uh, recommendation goes in the hand uh, with uh, my topic, which I presented, and uh, the recommendation is address the gender gap. Uh, I really like the example what you mentioned about the curve and stick. I believe that, uh, first of all, uh, for the case of Czech Republic, it is necessary to build the carrot, the child care system, sufficient child care system, then work with the state. Uh, and uh, another recommendation, and it was uh, already mentioned uh, in a previous panel, that uh, youth is, is the future. And in all parts of the political process, on local, regional, nation, European level, it is necessary to plan for the future. So that's my recommendation. The child care system is very important. But I would suggest that we should include needs in the design of our educational systems, policies, and, and programs. They should design the programs for them. Not only education, but also for training programs that they need to, to follow. This is the first one. Uh, include young people in design and education. Uh, the second one is something that we should also put a lot of emphasis in the soft skills of, uh, of these people. Leadership, problem solving. Empathy, entrepreneurship. We need to train, to upskill and reskill uh, young people. And it's not like when my father started to work, but he will do one job in his life. 
he will change one or two jobs. A young people, maybe he needs or she needs to change 10 or 20 jobs during his life. To become an entrepreneur and then to come back to, to a paid job, that means that we need to enhance the skills of this uh, person, especially the soft skills and the digital skills. That's my recommendation. Thank you. Um, I think that since we are a little behind the schedule, um, we will not open uh, the floor for questions uh, now, but I will encourage you all to approach the panelists, uh, maybe during a lunch break uh, or a later break uh, if you have, uh, have questions or things you would like to discuss with them. Uh, but before we go to lunch, um, I will give the word uh, to our rapporteur, Sama, uh, to summarize uh, the main takeaways uh, from this uh, panel. Uh, difficult job. Oh, thanks. So many. Is it working? Yeah. So many times it's a really difficult job because I have to tell that from the gender aspect we move to the big different topics and I have to tell that I was pretty touched by the discussion about the migration and there were like many super important messages were articulated and I think that uh, the key question what we should ask is about how our societies are prepared to be inclusive, not only towards the the gender aspect, but also towards the variety of the other differences or other other other, other kinds of the vulnerable vulnerabilities. Apologies for my <laughs> pronunciation. But just to wrap up what was told, I have to tell that it was I told that. I thought about what I'm going to tell because actually we have three countries with when we go when we go back to Juliet's um, presentation like each country is in different um, rate of the needs coming from Malta which is a low rate Czech Republic middle and Greece uh, uh, high rate of the of the needs number then there is a difference uh, regarding the, the gender gap again not need to, 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 to repeat but actually what I also heard from the discussion that at the beginning we we discussed the gender gap between females and males but also the gender discussion should be a bit more extended um, because there are also the other types of the questions which should be asked regarding the LGBT uh, uh, group which uh, are very much uh, disadvantaged in variety of the aspects um, what was also um, what what I took as a, as a message from the discussion was the statement from Esther who told that statistics might mask the underlying challenges. So sometimes the statistics might look very good, but we always have to think about the the variety of the really tiny groups which might be statistically very invisible, but the 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 the. the the challenges they are facing might be might be huge and very difficult for them, for their surrounding, for their families to to overcome. So actually, we cannot be happy or we cannot be relieved if the statistical uh, figures are very positive and uh, the the problem is always always there. And also what, what we should, what we should uh, think about is, is the diversity of the, of the needs group. Um, not necessary to, 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 to repeat again from Malta when the uh, number of, of uh, young educated, highly educated people are in the category of the needs to the variety of the different groups. Um, but also the aspect of, of the intersectionality of the marginalization, ma marginalization has to be taken into consideration. This was discussed again during the first presentation today, but it is absolutely different situation when you are young, uh, educated uh, mother <laughs> with a um, wonderful career, and if you are young Roma living in the uh, segregated environment with absolutely not uh, access to drinking water. So, and this by the, in the category of the young man, mothers, both, but their situation is very different. So the intersectionality of the marginalization is something that should be extremely vulnerable situation like this. It is, it is something what we, what we really should, should take with us. So thank you. Thank you. So, thank you everyone. We should continue to work. 
So I give the floor to our next panel on the rural urban divide. Thank you, and thank you for being here and staying awake after uh, the troubles of the lunch break. Maybe having a thought coming. So my name is Kari Jalonen, and I represent the Finnish partner in the Los Milenis Consortium, Demos Helsinki. And uh, I will be acting as a chair to this discussion on the burdens of the rural urban development. And we have uh, three exciting panelists here. Alexander Gergano, um, Ana Sofia Ribeiro, and Tatiana Ferreira. And I will, without further ado, I will give the floor to uh, the panelists. So, Alexander, go ahead. Thank you. It's okay. Uh, so, I will show you very briefly several slides about the urban road divide and I will try to start this panel discussion. Uh, this is a map of the Nuts 2 region uh, with the levels of needs. Uh, these are all the needs between 15 and 29 years. And uh, the blue color represents higher concentration of needs. And you can see uh, how much difference there is even within uh, the boundaries of a country uh, and this is because different regions even at the level of NUTS 2, uh, of NUTS 2, not to mention NUTS 3 of course which we don't have data for uh, at least at the EU level already available uh, there, there are so much differences in how developed these regions are from economic perspective from, from human perspective and you can uh, see this in this example where I will focus on two countries. One of the, uh, these two countries is my country, but this is not why I focus on them, but because these countries are very different from the rest of the European countries. Balkan countries in general tend to be different than uh, the rest of Europe. And you can see uh, the uh, percentage of needs I don't see the head of the slide, but okay, this is not that important. These are needs levels in cities. So these are just the needs, and here we are talking about needs 25 plus, so the target group of our project. Uh, so these are the needs levels uh, in cities, and you can see that here Bulgaria and Romania, the two countries I am talking about, uh, they do pretty well. They are below the average uh, for EU27. However, if we focus on the rural areas, you can see uh, these two countries, they immediately go at the top with the highest percentage of needs. And the big question is, what is the reason for this? In, Four countries that I've outlined here, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Greece, three of them Balkan countries. Uh, 25 plus needs are disproportionately distributed in suburban uh, and rural areas. And the reasons, some of the reasons, are lack of employment opportunities, limited mobility of the local labor force, challenges related to seasonal work, low availability of child care for young parents, which was covered extensively during the last panel, and closing of businesses. Basically, all the issues that we have mentioned so far are worsened in the rural areas. So every problem you can think of is even worse in rural areas, and even worse than that in rural areas in Bulgaria, Romania, Greece. And here you can see how large the gap is. So the blue bars represent the levels of needs in cities and the red, uh, dark red and bright red are the uh, levels of needs in urban areas. And you see how large the gap is between these two groups, especially in Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Greece. And 
there are so many other issues with needs that I can't go into detail for the limited time I have, but I, we already mentioned education and you can imagine how difficult it is in less developed regions and in rural areas and in Bulgaria there is basically no high education in these areas. So uh, the uh, percentage of school leavers is the highest in EU. And uh, undeclared work, we mentioned this, but we haven't focused uh, much on this. But it is so prevalent in rural regions. Basically, everything is undeclared. So I can't even say uh, whether these needs uh, work or they do not work, because they might be working in the uh, undeclared economy. And there are so many vulnerable groups living there, Roma in particular, and something that was not quite mentioned today, corruption and state capture. It's a huge problem in Bulgaria, and I can assume it's a big problem in Greece, in Romania, and probably other countries too. Uh, there is funding, there is investment in the rural regions. However, this, uh, these funds, they do not reach their target because of state capture, because of entrenched corruption that is wholesale, that is prevalent and it is organized. It is such a big problem that I can't disentangle the problem with needs with, from the problems with undeclared work with, from the problem with corruption and state catch. And this leads to mass depopulation. And what is a problem for us with depopulation comes as a problem to Finland as migration. So, we tend to think of these problems as local problems, however, these are EU-level problems. The local problem for one country is a local problem for another country. So we need to look at this as part of the big picture. And I had a slide with policy uh, <laughs> suggestions. Oh, oh my god. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> no, I will tell you what I think we could do, and of course, uh, this should be discussed. So maybe it is better that it is after the thank you slide. So, <laughs> uh, so I will just try to read it quickly because it is quite uh, a lot of text. So, one thing is allocating funds to less developed rural regions, but as I mentioned, we need to be mindful of the corruption risks. So I will move to the last point, which is improving resilience to corruption in rural municipalities and focusing on the rule of law. So these two should go hand in hand. Job creation and promotion of rural entrepreneurship, improving mobility. This was not mentioned much uh, until now. I hope that we focus more on this. Improving connectivity through investments in digital infrastructure so they don't have good internet, especially in countries like Bulgaria and Romania, and this needs uh, strategic investment. Uh, and development of agriculture, agritourism, and renewable energy is also something that can be done. Enhancement of off-season tourism in regions heavily reliant on tourism, this of course is Greece, but also Bulgaria too, and I assume other regions as well. Retaining and reskilling programs for regions affected by closures. So this is particularly um, up to date now that we focus a lot on the just transition and there is a lot of going on with the traditional work in these regions. So uh, a lot should be done there too. And stronger engagement of local level stakeholders instead of top-down approach that by national level leadership, what we tend to do is we do something at the EU level, then we drop it to the country level, then the country level drops it to the regional level, and it is one size fits all approach, and this approach doesn't work. So it should go bottom up, and co creation and involvement of local stakeholders and people who are the targets of these policies, they should be part of the process for this to work, otherwise, there is no chance. So thank you, these were my five cents or five ish minutes. Thank you so much, Alexander. My apologies for <laughs> and my apologies for the confusion with the slides. <laughs> and I'd just like to give the floor to uh, Tatiana. Okay, um, yes, I know, I know, but before 
<laughs> I'm also just briefly present myself. Thanks for asking me to. Uh, I'm a sociologist. I also teach in uh, higher um, education institution in a rural area in Portugal, in the center of Portugal. So I'm I'm being I'm researching uh, on this issue of rural uh, young people in the recent years, but I'm also working daily with uh, young people that live in rural in rural areas. So I think this has been for, for me a challenge and a, a great opportunity to merge these uh, two layers. Um, today here I'm representing a, a cost action on rural and uh, youth network uh, modeling. Um, the risks underlying rural needs social exclusion. Um, I, will not, I will not have time to present the cost action in, in deep. I will only say that we have uh, five working groups. Here I'm representing the working group one on social networks and social uh, inclusion. Um, the, the aim of our uh, working group is to, to um, identify the role of social networks like family, friends, neighbors, and rural communities at large, and also uh, to map the social inclusion processes, uh, namely the risk and protective factors at the rural community uh, level. Um, uh, in this presentation, I, I will focus mainly in the results uh, from uh, some of our outputs that we have been developing in the, the, the two last years in our working group. Uh, namely, I will focus on this policy brief that was uh, coming up, that came out uh, in in, a few, in, in, a, in previous months. Um, in this um, in this um, policy brief, um, first to say first to say that this policy brief was based on the on a previous report uh, about community-based uh, projects that. Uh, we think that promote participation in social inclusion of uh, youth needs in rural areas across Europe. Uh, Europe. Um, in, this, in this report, we had the opportunity to present several examples of community-based projects that have been implemented in rural areas across Europe. Um, um, this, the, the collection of data was, just to briefly say that the collection of data was made up uh, by an online survey to stakeholders, and the idea was to map the initiatives uh, for rural needs across Europe. We were able to, to map 43 projects from uh, 14 countries across Europe, and we also had the opportunity from these uh, 43, proje 43 projects to make some interviews. In this policy brief, we had, we, we had the, the, the aim to identify the projects that, that facilitates the participation and social inclusion of rural needs. Also to examine the barriers and obstacles that these projects face in rural areas and also to uh, try to present some practical recommendations uh, to support these projects over, to overcome these existing challenges. So briefly uh, trying to present some results. Um, one of the aims of this uh, report and this policy brief was to identify the main uh, obstacles and barriers that these projects at local level face in their development and implementation. We kind of try to organize these uh, challenges by in four different interplayed uh, layers or levels. Uh, in the first one, individual one uh, level, we, we identified some, some issues like the lack of interest of young people, the, self the lack of self-esteem, uh, the lack of the, the lack that young people have in, in institutions. And at organization level, we identified the lack, for example, of resources, of the know-how, know and also uh, the lack of consultancy and training in projects developed in rural areas. At community level, we have uh, identified the lack of transports and the necessity that uh, or the, the challenge that institutions face to have physical spaces to develop their work. 
And finally, at structural or macro level, we have uh, identified that these projects face complex bureaucratic processes, um, and also in the case, uh, we give here the example of the COVID-19 COVID, uh, COVID, uh, pandemic and social isolation that uh, also, not only young people, but organizations that address the work to them face in this period, and the lack of support they have. Uh, finally, in the, in the policy brief, we also try to present some recommendations to support these projects and to try to give some clues how they can uh, uh, overcome these obstacles. Uh, first, uh, regarding youth-centered approaches, we think that this, this is a very uh, important issue as key, uh, that we think that young people must be the key actors in the design, implementation and evaluation of the process, projects that are addressed to them. And uh, young people should have a role in defining the responses that meet their needs and expectations. We uh, underline some uh, strategies like support and fund youth needs initiatives and projects, facilitate projects that give uh, some kind of centrality to peer-to-peer -peer interventions. Um, uh, in, the, in the dimension uh, regarding connecting build bridges in the community, we think that it's important to raise awareness about, among rural youth of the existing community-based projects and how can they how can they benefit from them? Um, and finally, because I think I'm getting out of time, um, in the dimension uh, we also stress other dimension that is the need to empower and support community-based uh, organizations that face many challenges in their uh, in, the, in developing their work. And finally, finally, just to invite you all to. Uh, visit our, the website of our uh, network. Our network will end in March 2024, and we will uh, are able to uh, develop a European Rural Youth Observatory that will be launched after the post. And you are also invited to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last, I'd like to give the floor to Anna Sophia Bale. with employability answers to young needs by uh, age between 25 and 30 years old. So what I bring you all today are some insights, provisional insights from the tracking project, which is still going on. We, our project is coordinated by uh, ISCTE in Portugal and has several partners in Portugal, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Bulgaria, Estonia and Lithuania. And its main goal is to develop a model for evaluating the effectiveness of the types of support provided by public employment services. So digital, face-to-face -face, or mixed in improving employability among young needs in rural areas, like I said before, age between 25 and 29. Letters are too small, I apologize for that. Uh, so the, the process of uh, data collection comprises policy analysis stage, a longitudinal panel survey with young people, and also a comparative study of good practices in PES, uh, which is what I bring you here today. So the methodology for um, uh, identifying these good practices relied on uh, uh, a survey uh, done to, to all PES services in each of the six countries. Uh, we also conducted interviews with PES workers and focus groups and interviews with young needs. We also visited some services and we came up with these 18 case studies. Uh, some of them are also uh, still being finished, so not all are represented here, that uh, we consider to be best practices in the support of young needs. 
Our analytical model, uh, it's a qualitative space study predominantly. Uh, so to identify the good practices that uh, uh, are contained in these uh, services that I, I showed you before. So we have programs that are very varied in, in its uh, target. We have entrepreneurship programs, we have digital uh, uh, skills enhancement programs, we have programs that uh, rely on, on civic service or even with mobile employment services. So it's a huge, a huge diversity. So we have focused on what works, which was uh, our main concern, and what practices can be replicable, what are the opportunities that these good practices bring, and also the weaknesses specifically on the arrays. So, uh, to sum up our main messages that we can grasp from the analysis of this program is that uh, what works, uh, most of these programs are focused on providing training and inclusion actions for needs, both on site and remote. So, a lot of remote programs are being launched specifically after the, the, the pandemic. Uh, also, some emphasis is being provided on training models that meet the needs of the labor market. So that is the case, for instance, of training programs that are directly linked to labor market vacancies and that uh, specifically train people on specific competencies that will be needed by these uh, labor market vacancies. Also, the development of soft skills, particularly of entrepreneurship, so entrepreneurship skills are very valuable uh, on rural areas, particularly because people do not find uh, suitable jobs. So the answer is to, pro to create their own job for those who can. So another practice that also works is the continued support even after uh, young people getting the job. So in the job period of adaptation. And finally, the flexibility on service providing specifically on uh, public employment services. This means on rural areas, not waiting for people to come to you, but going into villages and presenting yourself and going out reaching your needs. The main limitations that we found in these programs is that vocational training that is linked to, to, to digital competencies requires some basis of digital literacy and infrastructure that is not easily available in rural areas, like it was mentioned before, some rural areas are deficient in terms of internet connection. Many of these interventions, like was also pointed today, are not specifically designed to needs, and this is critical in rural areas because needs in rural areas are very few, and uh, our demographic characteristics in Europe, and particularly in Portugal, where I came from, is out, out of a very aged population, so it's hard to, to, to design particular policies for needs. Uh, interventions are not sustainable on the long term because they are attached to European funding and are project-based. Intermobility is also a great challenge. Uh, the transportation system is very deficient or in existence in many rural areas. And finally, considering public employment services, uh, human resources are an issue because it's difficult to recruit and also the human resources are old and they need to be capacitated to deal with young needs. So these were my main messages. Uh, if you want to know more about tracking, you can check our website. We will have our uh, final conference in January here in Brussels. You're all invited and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Yeah. And we have a bit of time for discussion. And to get us started, I'd like to start with a, maybe a summarizing question for a lot of the discussion that we've been having today. Um, we talked, or you have talked in your presentations a lot about uh, the um, actions taken to help uh, needs in rural areas. I would like to take a step back and look at the problem specific to this very broad um, population. And I, I'd like to hear your views on what specifically are the support needs of rural needs and how do they differ from those of their peers in urban settings? And if I can ask a follow-up to save a bit of time, 
I'd like to see hear your views on whether you see any concrete service gaps between the services available to these needs and uh, what they would need. You, you talked a bit about this, but if you could give me an overview. Um, would it make sense for uh, to go in reverse with Anna Sophia beginning? So, uh, uh, like I was saying, I think uh, regarding the support and, uh, well, what are the main obstacles and the support needed by rural young people in, in, in rural areas, I think transportation is definitely, definitely an issue. Even uh, in other projects uh, that is also funded by, by the EA grants, it's called Stay On. Uh, I was attending a uh, conference in April and young people were present and they pointed mobility <coughs> as a, a great issue. But when presented with uh, the possibility of, uh, for instance, services being provided to them where they live, they said, no, uh, what we want is really transportation. <laughs> so it's, it's really a mobility issue. We want public transportation and we want to be able to look for jobs elsewhere without needing to leave the place where we live, so we need to be able to commute. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, uh, well, it's sometimes if you don't have a car, or if you don't have a driver's license, um, you're not autonomous uh, to this regard. Either you rely on your support networks, or you're not able to, to move yourself. And this is really an infrastructure as well. Then regarding um, the, 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 the digitalization and this, this transition that we are facing, uh, sometimes it is uh, granted that uh, all young people are digital natives and they know how to work with uh, internet and uh, uh, application systems. And this, for instance, in the case of public employment services is not granted because, for instance, to get registered and uh, in the youth guarantee program in Portugal, you would have to access an internet portal to, 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 to register yourself. And if you don't know how to do this, or if you face some kind of difficulty, either you have some help of somebody else, or you won't get registered at all. So you always need a mediator to bring you to, this, to the system. So I think digitalization and transport are, are, are issues that should be, be considered. But, uh, there are others, of course. Of course. Thank you very much. Uh, Tatiana, how would you comment on this? Uh, I agree with Sophie. Uh, I also stressed in my presentation some of the issues that Sophie has underlined now. I would add to this issue uh, the part of uh, my vision from the perspective of community-based projects. Just to say that the, the, the big issue for young people and for these projects is that because they, young people are fewer in rural areas, they are not seen as a resource. So they are, they are invisible to public policies and they, they don't address to them uh, responses, services, uh, they don't care, take care of them. And they don't see that, uh, for example, in the case of Portugal, I think it, it is not, as Sophia uh, underlined, it's not uh, only a characteristic of uh, geographical characteristic of Portugal is the population and the increase of older people and the huge decrease of young people. We must see, for example, to develop rural areas that young people are a resource. So they cannot be invisible, they must be visible and uh, the focus of these uh, public policies and these community projects are, are, are aren't able to develop their work because they, they, they don't have the support from uh, public policies to develop them. So visibility of young people towards uh, policy makers and service providers. Yes. yes. Even at local level, a policy maker, a policy, uh, public policies at local level, because municipalities, for example, in the case of Portugal, in rural areas, the, they are focused on other young people because they are, they have many, they have, they have this issue of the, they being a, 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 a region that has many old people and they forget of young people and they don't see how they can uh, intersect the dimensions and develop rural areas through young people as a resource. Yes, thank you. <coughs>
Alexander, how does this scheme from your perspective? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there are two aspects to this. One is that uh, something simple needs to be done right away. And I agree that mobility, visibility, including these uh, young people in co-creation approaches, this is something relatively easy to do. We can easily improve digital infrastructure and this will help right away. But if I think about the uh, heart of the problem, uh, it's there are so many problems intertwined uh, with each other which lead to the underdevelopment of these regions. So I have no idea where, where to start there, but if I need to give a long-term solution, I would focus on two things, education and anti-corruption, and I don't know if I can frame a non-corrupt local government as a service, but uh, we would definitely like to have such service in Bulgaria. Uh, but the, what we could do is focus more on assessment, on evaluation, on evaluation of how funds that are spent are actually spent, on what is their impact. And this goes for all initiatives, uh, including rural, on rural needs, that we really need to focus on the impact of what we are doing in order to know whether this is really successful or we are just wasting some money on something. Thank you, Alexander. That was a very concise statement. And I think that would take the way towards my last question of the day very well. And again, I have a twin pronged question. So, who First, who stands to help these young needs? Uh, who in the public sector has the, is in the best position to um, serve their interests? And second, what would you say to these policy makers? What would your recommendations be to those? Yes. Maybe we can start with that, yeah. Um. I, I, from, I speak for myself, I'm trying to do this in the last years, try to, to reach uh, policy makers and, and to try to see them that young people are not invisible. So to give visibility to young people, I think that uh, uh, um, in the projects that I've, I've been participating, I think that uh, technicians that work in public, pub, uh, public services are not, don't have training, for example. They, they have an um, uh, adult-centric adult vision of what is being a young person. And they don't have uh, the knowledge on, uh, on youth dynamics. I think that this, um, one of the solutions could be inter, uh, to connect academy with, uh, with the political uh, actors. It, 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 this is very difficult because we have different temporalities we have different uh, aims, but I think the, 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 the answer could be this uh, connection between the knowledge and the, the, the people that have the money and the, the power to implement the, 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 the measures. And I think that we are always uh, uh, walking in different streets and we don't connect. It's difficult. I think that it's, uh, we must make the work in the two ways because also uh, researchers have a focus uh, that is more uh, scientific or, or that many times could be a good topic and I think we can, it's difficult that the, the idea is to, to connect these two lines. Thank you. Yes, I think, uh, well, from my side as a researcher, I think uh, more research is needed. <laughs> but more research is needed, but maybe not research as we're doing it, because we could work with what we already have and we are not sharing. There is no, in, in some cases I think uh, there is, but in many others there is no communication, for instance, between uh, educational system data and employment service data that would allow us if integrated to follow the same person longitudinally all over the years and prevent when they exit the system and when they re-enter and see patterns. 
I think this would be very important if we started to, to, to do this. Of course, we have problems of that protection to do this. So, but uh, ideally, we would be able to do this. And also on another front, I think more collective studies um, that are focused on the time usage, the usage of, of what are young people doing when they are not in training or education would help us. No? Because this is the big mystery. We define this category by saying what they do not do, but we don't actually know what they do. So it would be interesting to know what is it that they are doing and then focus on this, that maybe we could find some answers on how are they active and how can we make this activation be productive and be visible. Thank you. Yes, thank you. The, the mission of our organization is building bridges between policy makers and researchers. So as a researcher, I always like more study, more data, more evaluations, more methodologies. Uh, but uh, if I think from the point of view of policy makers, what we really need to do is to gather more together uh, different groups of stakeholder, uh, stakeholders and talk more with each other and this of course should include needs so maybe getting more knowledge to the people who can use it in the decisions yeah finding the luggage and then delivering it <laughs> that, you make can it sound very simple uh, yes uh, uh, just to, say, to, to complement what alexander was saying that I think that, as I said in our presentation, in the, these myth-based projects, the, the key issue is to give voice to young people. So I think we can talk uh, uh, in research, in, in public services or uh, politicians, but we also, also have to include young people in this discussion and go behind consultation. Because, for example, in the state of Portugal, they say young people participate in decisions when they consult them by doing the survey. No, this is not the issue. It's to include them in the development and implementation of the projects because only them know what is better for their needs and expectations. And many times we don't hear the voices of young people. That is a very good uh, final word to end this discussion. Thank you. But before we go forward, I'd like to uh, give the floor to my lost millennials colleague, Balash Tedeksby, to um, call maybe uh, summarize some of the key strands in this discussion. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. So I have, uh, I try to pinpoint just the main ideas from this panel. And um, the key words which I noted for me is like uh, transport or, or mobility, uh, overcoming this rural gap, digitalization, visibility at local level, uh, education, and no corruption or fight against corruption. So these would be the five key words uh, which summarize uh, our your vote. And um, yeah, uh, and the recommendation will be more research. And then everybody mentioned that. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, connecting uh, research with dissemination, so doing research is one thing, but we have to go wide and uh, open uh, these results for the policy makers, and uh, yeah, and to make this uh, issue more uh, sensitive, so uh, people, to, I mean, the decision makers to be more sensitive from this. Uh, another, it's, a, it's a, right, like a practice that uh, you are mentioned, all of you, that uh, these are uh, very uh, diverse problems, very complex, uh, which, uh, which lead uh, to me the conclusion that uh, we cannot uh, deal with this issue vertically. <coughs> so if we try to deal with the needs issue vertically, like the neighbor office, the uh, Ministry of Education, then we will not solve the needs issue. So we need horizontal approach. <coughs> this is one of the main question, uh, main points. And uh, secondly, we need uh, flexibility at the local level because every particular rural area has its particular uh, I don't know, big size, and there is no uniform uh, policy to deal with this. So we need local knowledge for to solve local uh, issues. This would be a short. Yes. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all participants in this panel for a very nice discussion. It's been a privilege to be part of this.
Evaluation is a systematic and intentional way to analyze and assess data. It's about learning and measuring the values and effects of your processes while providing information on how effective and sustainable they are and whether they can be replicated in other contexts. But most importantly, it answers essential questions like Does my initiative matter? Is it relevant? Does it have the right objectives? How are young people involved? What can I learn from it and how can I improve it? Which is why it's important to strengthen the youth sector's capacity for evaluation to improve the quality and impact of its initiatives. The Youth Partnerships eLibrary brings together inspiration and a well-organized collection of evaluation reports on different topics that are important to young people, youth policy and youth work, like mental health, employability, mobility, inclusion, leisure time and so on. If you're looking for inspiration to develop and improve new policies, programs or projects, check out the eLibrary. It contains a variety of methods and approaches, from classical to experimental, that will support you to conduct evaluation. It also highlights good practice reports produced by a wide range of actors, governments, youth organisations and researchers, working at international, European, national and local levels. Regardless of your position, youth worker, policy maker, civil servant, NGO staff or academic, the e-library can give you ideas and help you understand what works, for whom and in what conditions. Visit the e-library, learn from its various sections and share your examples to keep building this common resource for the whole youth sector. Uh, but there are many 
many elements that have been discussed now that are not directly related to employment um, and that are actually relevant for employment and for the quality of life of young people. Uh, that it's health, uh, that may be social participation and relationship with the others, um, that may be also from the perspective of, uh, of employment, one of the challenges uh, that have been already mentioned and it's proved by evaluation, it's outreach. And generally what we have in employment policies or in education policies for young people, it's not providing instruments for outreach for the, uh, the young people. Um, younger young people or older young people, plus 24, um, what it is, it's generally youth work, that it's again, not a very, very well-known practice, uh, that it's providing um, non-formal instruments to work with young people of any age, younger or older. Um, and youth work, it's extremely valuable, as far as we know, from what we know as evaluations, um, in order to provide young people with uh, soft skills and cross-cutting skills that are needed for, for employment and to outreach them for employment. Um, so, I say, for the employment part, we do have a lot of evaluations. If you look at the e library that we have, more than half of the reports available are on youth employment, or if not more than half, about 40%. Now, because we really looked into other kinds of evaluations as well. Um, but the most easy available are the ones on employment. And generally, from my experience, at least in Romania that you already saw, it's not the best student. We are uh, uh, with the highest uh, um, percent of uh, young needs, with the highest or the second highest. Um, gender uh, gap and so on. At least in Romania, recommendations from evaluations or on the youth uh, warranty have been, in most of the cases, follow up, followed up. So I, I would say the challenge is not necessarily in that part on employment, but actually on the other things that are supporting employment, like soft skills capacity of young people to be integrated in the communities and social uh, networks that come with other policies as well, that we have a weight less. So we know less how they work and how we can make them work better. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, so I haven't introduced any other of my panelists because I don't want to do them any justice. I would prefer if you introduce yourselves. Um, so we'll start with you, Tomas. So um, tell us a little bit who you are, uh, your experience, your expertise in monitoring and evaluation, and why is the topic important? Thank you. And first of all, that's really an honor to be here and to be on that closing conference of the project. But I truly believe that this what we achieved will last way longer and will build the evidence community. Um, for helping uh, lost millennials. So my name is Tomasz Gajdorowicz, I, I represent the Evidence Institute Foundation, which is an um, NGO based in Poland that is focusing mainly on what is like rooted in the name of our institution, which is Evidence Institute. So our main mission is to disseminate the truly and high quality evidence on men in actually field of the labor market and education and these are also the fields that mainly this project is focusing on uh, why is that so important because if you look at the reports the data that you might google or find anywhere you will see you will find evidence for anything I mean, there are multiple reports repeating and like mining the data information round and round, providing evidence to anything. But the problem is that the quality of that evidence differs heavily. So what we were trying to do, and I thought I see this as the mission in this project, and in general I would say in life, 
um, is disseminating high quality evidence based mainly on the experimental studies, the randomized controlled trials, the golden standard of evaluation. Then the quasi-experimental approaches were always looking at the counterfactual uh, situations. So, so everything the same with just one difference. And that's somehow written in the European level documents uh, everywhere. But the reality is way different. And we all know also from this project how difficult is that to get high quality evidence. I mean, if you really look into it, there is always a selection bias, uh, statistical problems, lack of the data, and so on. But actually, it's, and, and very often there is another argument, like um, saying that running the experiment is unjust, it's selective, and so on. But the question is, is it better to invest resources really not the huge ones, to really test something and implement it in the most efficient way, is it better than just implementing many interventions without evidence based on our intuitions or, or not? And that's something that happened in Poland, for example, for over, over many years. We had many social programs. I'm not now saying if they were good or, or bad, but the main motivation for these programs was the sentiment of few old men sitting somewhere in the government, which is ridiculous. I mean, that, that's a situation not only in Poland, in many other countries. So I see this, honestly, as the mission for this project, but also the patriotism of a modern world, to look at the evidence and make the public money spent effectively uh, and implement the quality of the interventions and the policies that are implemented. So yeah, that, that's that's. Quick. Thank you. That was amazing. Akira, <laughs> hi. Uh, my name is Kinga Tut, uh, and I'm a colleague at Kate Paul Research Institute, uh, which has been um, already talked about by Luta, so I won't uh, going to repeat that. Uh, but what I would like to tell you is for one that I'm working for the Division for Public Policy and Impact Assessment. So as you can imagine, I deal with social research and evaluation of impact assessment. Uh, and uh, related to that, uh, in the Los Millennials project, there has been nine evaluation carried out by beneficial partners, uh, evaluating initiatives, uh, targeting in one way or another uh, 25 plus needs. Uh, and uh, out of these evaluations, we created a synthesis report, uh, which was a uh, thematic synthesis of, uh, of the main findings of the evaluations. And I would like to very, very briefly uh, just outline some main uh, messages or results we have found. Um, it has been mentioned multiple times today that 25 plus leads is a very heterogeneous group. Uh, and one of our main um, <coughs> results uh, was that uh, the initiatives which were evaluated has varied greatly in scope, in implementers, in funding, uh, in the exact uh, activities carried out. There has been a great variety. Uh, but um, those projects or those initiatives uh, which could reflect on the exact situation of the individuals they are working with. Uh, so those projects which could be flexible and adaptable uh, to the exact situation they are dealing with uh, were considered um, in a I mean, better lack of term, uh, better than uh, other projects. So it's, it's a key um, element of, uh, of successful projects. And, uh, and not just the not just reflection on the individuals, but on the needs of the local labor market. Uh, most initiatives were employment initiatives uh, in this case as well. Um, and also, again, since this group is very heterogeneous and in many cases kind of invisible, uh, in the sense that they are considered. Unemployment, unemployed people, and in many cases they are not exactly considered young people. Uh, this is something which is changing right now. Uh, we have found that the most vulnerable people are not really targeted 
uh, with programs. Uh, it has already been mentioned before that uh, in many cases you already have to be in the system to be uh, part of a project. Uh, so those who are not in any kind of systems or, uh, or considered to be a tough case uh, can fall through the net and uh, are not uh, targeted. So programs finding and working with the most vulnerable are very important. Uh, and uh, again, um, those programs which can fill a gap between other employment or training programs uh, can have a lot of influence because they can target either um, more invisible groups of young people or if they can utilize um, specific methodology or, or carry out specific activities, uh, they can have a lot of effect uh, on uh, helping these people being integrated into other programs as well, which can help uh, them, for example, in the labor market. Um, we've been talking about the, the aspect of gender today, uh, we have found that uh, this was something which has not really been considered in the project, in the sense that um, it wasn't a core part uh, in the project design. Uh, to think about that these young people, with uh, all the, their other uh, uh, identity and, and uh, issues and uh, uh, life status, they also have a gender. Uh, it's not being considered that they are women, they are men, and not even talking about transgender or non-binary people. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily considered as an aspect. Um, yeah, and um, I think most initiatives uh, which have been uh, evaluated were project-based. And this is, again, something which has been mentioned before, that project-based uh, initiative and project based operation. While it has a lot of advantages uh, for uh, uh, giving opportunities for new methods and, uh, and smaller scale programs uh, to, to have, uh, have a chance, it creates problems, funding dependency and, um, and focusing on reaching indicators uh, rather than working uh, with uh, more vulnerable or, or tougher cases. Um, and again, uh, finding the best professionals for the work, because if you only have funding for a certain uh, period of time, it might be hard to, to find those professionals who can afford to work for you. Um, so these are the briefest. Uh, summary of the synthesis report, but we will be talking about uh, other aspects later. Thanks. Okay. Uh, good afternoon from my side as well. Um, in uh, this consortium, my name is uh, Peter Fanta, and uh, in this consortium, Los uh, Millennial, as well as in this last panel, and actually the last one in the last panel. Yeah, you are. Does, does it mean anything? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nobody will be like a very special. Okay. No, I'm actually, I'm not the last one. I'm the last one. one we, we still have. Um, okay. So I represent here Ilias Institute for Structural Policy, uh, which is uh, Prague, uh, which is a Czech Republic-based uh, non-profit organization, which focuses in uh, basically three areas: uh, regional development, uh, where we do a lot of evaluations. Uh, environmental policy and uh, social issues where our colleagues so work with uh, um, uh, development especially in the educational system in the Czech Republic. Uh, as I say I represent here the regional branch of, uh, of our institute of our NGO which uh, focuses on uh, uh, among others on evaluations. Uh, I personally have uh, more than uh, 15 years, or roughly around uh, 15 years of experience with uh, evaluations, mostly evaluations of uh, European uh, funds, funded uh, programs or projects or initiatives in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, but uh, I also have some experience which I can transfer here from uh, a rural development uh, program uh, evaluation where I participated uh, 
with my colleagues on uh, ex post evaluation of uh, uh, rural development program in terms of last period? Um, well, uh, from the uh, point of view, Tomas is uh, focusing more on evidences on quantitative <coughs> methods. Uh, I, in my practice, use more qualitative uh, based methods. And um, uh, maybe I will just uh, step a little bit into the next question, which I hope you have prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to just um, say hi and then we can go to the questions so that we don't forget you? Yes, uh, to be the last, the last session. Uh, my name is Juan Delgado from the University of Lugos and uh, our main fields on entrepreneurship and uh, financing and employment, especially in the case of uh, needs of young people. And uh, I also have to the reporter, so my goal here is to take notes and by the very end, Thank you, Samara, as much as possible. Thank you. <laughs> if you can read it. <laughs> okay, so, um, but, yes, I did prepare the question. Do you want what me to ask question? it? What is the question? Okay, so, so as you say, you're very much based on, on evidence and very much on experimental, uh, on experimental methods. So if, if you look at the different monitoring and evaluation uh, procedures, why are you so stuck, if I might use that word, <laughs> on the experiment and, and, what, and for you, what do you think we're missing if we just focus on that one area and vice versa? Do I just start? No, then I end to react to what you say. <laughs> oh, okay. It's always much harder to start. This is a <laughs> controversial discussion between quantitative and qualitative uh, evaluators. Uh, actually, uh, I think that quantitative quantitative evaluations is where are very strong and very necessary, are, are really needed. But uh, unfortunate, uh, unfortunately, quantitative approach usually needs a, a big data set. Uh, a lot of data, which not always are available. As we could see in the, during the evaluation of uh, our needs 25 plus group, uh, which is, um, I think the biggest problem is that the NIST 25 are not generally recognized target group. Therefore, no data, uh, almost no data are available for this target group. And uh, we had to search for the data and we had to pick up the data from uh, uh, some secondary sources uh, and uh, it was not always easy. That's why, for example, we have chosen uh, to use uh, qualitative methods instead of quantitative because uh, it was really, it was almost impossible for us to reach uh, the data for, uh, for quantitative methods. And uh, if I may start a controversial discussion with you, <laughs> I, uh, no, I say, uh, I, I, do, I, I don't want to uh, say anything wrong about quant uh, quantitative uh, methods. They are really needed. Uh, but the, I think that uh, quantitative methods uh, can confirm some hypothesis. But we need to know the hypothesis. We have to formulate the hypothesis and we have to know that. Maybe to make will not uh, agree with me, but this is my, this is my stance. And uh, I think that qualitative evaluations are really good, uh, uh, good way how to uh, either confirm the quantitative evaluation finding or how to bring out new hypotheses for uh, quantitative Next, do you want to, to react? <laughs> Very briefly. Well, I'm not, I mean, both, of course, need one another, the qualitative and quantitative. But, but the problem is we will never, never lose qualitative approach because all of us, the groups and individuals, we have opinions, right? Naturally, any statement without data is just opinion. Yeah? So, I'm not afraid of that. The problem is usually that we are missing with the quantitative puzzle that, you know, is needed to say anything robust, to say anything that is true. And that's the part where we need to, like, stress a lot for a simple reason. Without ex-ante planning for evaluation, 
especially the experimental evaluations that are the only like 100% quality source of information, we will lose it. I mean, many programs that were rolled out and someone like is trying to evaluate them ex post. That's impossible in most cases because there are so many biases. So that's why we need to like shout and vote all of us to make all the projects prepared prior to their implementation with the appropriate uh, evaluation scheme. That's, that's, that's what's needed. And honestly, in social sciences, there are still not many evaluations of that kind. Well, if you look at the business, all the businesses that are running and improving their policies are doing experiments all the time. If you go to Starbucks and get coffee, the way the person is inviting you to give the order was tested experimentally. They are rolling it out every week on the randomized sample of cafeterias and so on. Why in social sciences we are so connected to our opinions? I have opinions, but I think they are less relevant than the data that is to support them. And those randomized control trials, there were some areas where they were, uh, as you said, I'm stuck with the randomized control trials because they are the only reliable source of information. Not the only, but the most reliable source, source of information. If, I mean, if you look at if you look at evaluation methods, that's the only one that's not biased. That's the method that is, or mostly not biased. <laughs> that's, that's the method. I mean, why why are we when we go to the doctor and we got a, like the risk, we, we have some I don't know antibiotic or any other medicine. We are all certain that it went through the process of randomized experiments where the, there was a population who took this uh, medicine, there was a population that was controlled, and they took placebo, no one knows who got what, and we see what is the health status after one month or a year or whatever. Why we don't require from policymakers this kind of thinking? That's my aim, like to try to convince people that it's not a, our, I don't know, Fanaberia opinion, we need it to roll out our interventions that are really evidence-based, proved, and that are really working. Because if you look at, for example, the field of education, that's, I think, the field where we both are working. If you look how many myths were implemented in educational policies and destroyed the educational systems because someone thought that's good strategy, like with teaching methods. I mean, all of us think that there are some teaching methods that are better than others. But the evidence is very often against what we think. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, um, I, I actually largely agree with you. Last, last yes, point. Yes. You, you said the large data samples. For the, if we have a, if we want to see the population effects and we are exposed, we do need a large sample. But do you think, what do you think is the sample where medical, med medicines and treatments are treated on? These are usually 50, 100, something like that participants in each experiment. I mean, in social sciences we would need a bit more. But on the other hand, it's easier than having like sick people and implement therapies on, on them, right? But these are not always very large data samples we need. It just requires a mindset to allow ourselves to randomize treatments and resources at some point in the pilot experimental project. Thank you, but do you think um, just focusing on um, RCTs, for example, does it lose the context? Because I think that's what uh, many uh, researchers who focus on mixed methods or qualitative, they feel like a person is so much more uh, complex than maybe the medicine because they have their day-to-day -day, um, um, struggles and, and, and life situations. So if you just put them in a group like that, you kind of um, leave out the, the other aspects, the day-to-day -day things that also influence such such a thing. So yes, I agree with you in a sense you, you get the good data, but in a sense you lose also the context. According to me, which I should not be arguing with this, I, I am the chair. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> After
after after the after the experiments and the data we have, there comes I mean discussion about it and qualitative explanation why something happened this way, not the other, and that's always needed. But as I said, we will not lose this part. We love to talk about stuff, but first we need to have some concrete, and that's what missing here. Okay, so, so I think we, we actually agree. So yeah. we agree that we need data, but we also agree to kind of confirm of or course. get the context we need for the data at the end. Um, so so but when you speak about data and evidence, so, um, so policymakers need evidence to, to implement the policies, but we do a lot of research. Yes, it might not be RCT, so it might not be the good the best quality, but we still do a lot of evaluations with good quality results. How are we best supposed to communicate that to policymakers so that they can translate into into policy? Uh, maybe Irina, I'll start with you. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. I, I think this is a very important question. I I discovered I think rather lately than uh, in in the past that. Uh, we do a lot of evaluations, or I do a lot of evaluations, with mixed quality, I would say. So some of them are good quality, others are extremely rushed. And I think this is one of the things. Evaluations don't come as researchers or evaluators will plan them. They come when the policymakers or uh, the owners of a program will uh, ask for them. So in many cases, we are not in charge of how we plan things, uh, and we try to catch up. In many cases, some things that we can measure quantitatively, like soft cross-cutting skills, like the uh, skills to or competence to communicate and relate to others and work in teams, may be measured quantitatively, but it's extremely difficult to do it in a couple of months. So we based our uh, work on qualitative uh, research that it's doable in the time that, uh, that we have. Um, and then we do have an important barrier to pass into communicating our results. And I think there are two different skills uh, that people like us doing research and evaluation should develop. The first is to do research and evaluation, and the second is to communicate it, to write reports uh, and summaries in a language that is accessible to uh, our target groups. Um, that may be policy makers, program owners like the uh, uh, European Commission um, and the managing authorities, um, young people or youth organizations and so on. Um, we really do need to develop this because I think we are, at this moment, somehow living in pretty different worlds. And I would argue with you that we do produce, as researchers, we do produce reports, but whether the funding agency or whoever funds the project actually reads the reports, even if they are written in the language, um, is, is challenging. So for me as a researcher, I struggle with the fact that yes, I can translate the, the results into paper, but how do I make the policy maker read that paper? I think we need to uh, meet somehow halfway. Mm -hmm. So we need to do uh, better, more efforts to write them short and in an accessible language. And then we need to advocate for them to read them um, and to build their institutional structures in a way that they will have, I don't expect uh, a minister to read a whole report, but to have a structure where, where, where uh, a person in the institution, a civil servant or um, a person employed will read the whole report, will make a summary in line with the policy uh, priorities, because this is a totally other word. Um, and then translate the recommendations and uh, uh, conclusions for the, uh, the decision maker. So I think we all need to do this, uh, these efforts, but from what we can do on our side, I still think that we can write better reports. Yes, thank you. And King, can you please add? Yeah, well, 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, not uh, exactly uh, problems, but challenges. Uh, <laughs> because, um, of course, it's different when, uh, when evaluation has... Um, so, so when there's, uh, there's someone who is interested in the evaluation, this is a, a big plus in the beginning, if someone is interested uh, beforehand. Uh, it's not necessarily the case uh, uh, every time. Uh, and in many cases, um, you, already, you need to have an already established uh, connection to the policymakers uh, to make your voice heard, because otherwise they won't uh, read your report, even if you create an executive summary which is uh, very short and uh, very graphic and very uh, colorful. Um, and again, uh, to be fair, I think there's a limit how um, simple you can make uh, your report or your summary. Um, but I would like to raise another aspect, uh, and it is uh, communicating to the target groups. Because for one thing, I think in many cases um, the need hasn't even arisen horizon before to as in, for the evaluators to communicate their results to the target groups. For example, in the case of needs or 25 plus needs. Uh, and again, because how do you communicate to a group which is largely invisible uh, and which have no um, organization? So uh, needs did not yet organize themselves. Uh, so how, how do you how do you communicate to them? Who to, who to contact, if, if you would like uh, to talk to me. Uh, and um, a possible solution or, or, a, or a possible pathway uh, for this, in my opinion, could be uh, the use of participatory methods, uh, which, again, a totally different approach, of, a totally different way of thinking, because if you are really doing the participatory methods, for example, um, participatory action research or something like that, then those who are the, the target of the research or the evaluation are again those who will carry out the evaluation. So they will tell us what is the research questions. Not we create the research or the evaluation questions and they will research it and everyone's happy. Uh, and this is a completely different mm -hmm. mindset, uh, which is not really present at the moment in, in evaluation, in my opinion. Thanks. Um, Pet, maybe Peter, because I can't pronounce it in the Czech. Sure, maybe um, uh, react to the first question, which is how to communicate the results to policymakers, and also if you have an input to how to communicate to the target group and. I'm wondering, is it even, it's necessary to include the target group, but I wonder if it's necessary to communicate the results to the target group because... Uh, Julia, please. Sorry, uh, I'm... This is, this is oh, too no. much for me. Okay, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm too old to, to hold all your questions. Uh, I will try to raise the first one. Okay, uh, okay uh, so the policy makers, um, I think this is, uh, I completely agree with what uh, was already said. Uh, <coughs> uh, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of a transmitter receiver. Mm -hmm. Evaluators are the transmitters and the politicians are the receivers, uh, policy makers. By the way, do we have any receivers here? Okay, so I'm uh, going to talk to evaluators instead. Um, yeah, the thing is that uh, if the policymakers uh, should uh, listen to us, evaluators, we need to give them recommendations. Uh, easy, uh, simple, uh, operational, and feasible recommendations. Unfortunately, I have seen a lot of evaluation reports, uh, especially in Czech Republic, where there were no, absolutely no recommendations. Uh, my colleague Martin, you know him, uh, from the cons 
consortium, he says that uh, without recommendations, uh, it is just an analysis, just another analysis. It is not an evaluation. Uh, and I agree completely with that. Uh, so the thing is that we should communicate our recommendations uh, from the evaluations to the policy makers. And how to do it? It's, uh, again, uh, I have seen uh, evaluation reports with recommendations. But the recommendations were like, uh, we should focus more on needs 25 plus. And what does it mean? Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. So uh, in our evaluations, uh, we try to operationalize uh, the recommendations, say exactly what to do, at what time to do, and what we expect as a result, what steps should be taken exactly. And uh, that's something, if you have the recommendations and you have exactly the steps which need to be uh, undertaken to improve something, in that case, uh, the policy makers can understand it because they are not going, they don't have time to read the whole analysis and find their own solutions. So we have to give them the steps and uh, when to do it and exactly what should be done and what we expect from that. And uh, if we formulate our recommendations in evaluations like this, in that case, uh, they might listen to us. So at least on the, receive, uh, on the transmitter side, uh, we will improve and we will just Hope that the receiver, the receiver will be on, and maybe on the conference where this will be. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, fully agree with that. And the issue that we need to change uh, completely the way we are providing results and writing reports. I would say we would, we should get out of our ivory towers where we do our analysis and do talk about the RCTs and so on. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I mean, policy makers are also people. I mean, what they are doing is they are scrolling the internet as we do, and their attention span, as all of us, has decreased over the last 10 years to few seconds every few minutes, right? And that's also where we should be. I mean, we should translate what we have, the long, boring reports, into, I know I mean, the reports from these projects are not boring, but from the other projects. <laughs> from the other projects. We need to translate it into do's and don'ts. These are facts, these are myths. Don't believe it, believe it, because there is evidence. Of course, always referring to something uh, from literature or something where you can deepen this topic. Um, and, and, and then, of course, be more controversial. Usually in social sciences, the recommendation and the uh, general picture is like, well, it, de it depends, it's nuanced, there are so many dimensions and issues. Well, that's not, that's not something that will translate into anything actionable, right? We need to be controversial, to say the word is always gray, but let's put it more a bit more white and black, showing what's the good thing, what's the bad thing. So, so being like this more, being rather like in news type uh, messages than the long reports that are on, the, on somewhere on the desk or, or the bookshelf. And finally, as uh, I said that policymakers are also people and they have their incentives. I mean thinking of the policymakers' incentives compatibility showing how they can benefit of a certain policies. I'm not talking about corruption, I'm talking about showing to them how they can achieve their professional goals or, or their desired things through implementation of a certain programs. I mean, we are all people and in understanding incentives compatibility and clear messages is the way forward. Otherwise, we will be just on the bookshelf another like heavy position and we don't want to stay there too, too long. I totally, totally agree with that. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, we're kind of running out of time, so um, do you have any last comments? So what have we learned? We've learned as researchers, uh, we need, as transmitters, we need to transmit the message in a way that it can be received by the person <laughs> on the other side and maybe form better connections and also use um, good quality evidence and backed up with a little bit of okay. so well <laughs> is there any final words from from the speakers? 
well um, to summarize, which is difficult, and I apologize in advance because probably uh, many other topics that haven't been, uh, haven't been able to take notes of them. Uh, passion, passion is the, is the session, I guess, no? Passion. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, to summarize, uh, I guess we, we have to begin with uh, what is the aim of evaluations and in this video by Elena, it's quite been quite clear to, to consider the viability, the replicability, and especially on the long term focus, the uh, learning to look for the future. And this links to what Peter said on uh, the recommendation, being able to make strong recommendations and also better some developers. Um, it's been really interesting to, to know the young partnerships and what you do uh, at the Council of Europe and uh, your, uh, your idea that maybe there are you know, many issues on job employment, but there are other factors such as uh, other topics such as uh, um, soft, soft skills, which are probably more difficult to measure or to analyze, and this is, this is lacking. And probably this is something we can consider for the future of our research. Um, yeah, we have had uh, well, the tension of qualitative <laughs> between on the academic tension and uh, on the on the qualitative versus quantitative approach to to, to research, and, uh, which has been all around. We have some hours of the project. We have been around for the two years of the project, and uh, and uh, and we have transitioned to whether our research should be inductive or deductive in, in, at that point in time and uh, in, the, in the session. Um, but we have come to the conclusion that both of them are relevant. It all depends on, on the situations, on the time frame for the evaluation of how time avail data availability and, and so on. I'm skipping many issues. And, and then probably the, the, the relevance of uh, how to how to disseminate the results of our, of our research. Because our researchers, we are always passionate about including the, the research. We have talked about this in the previous sessions, and, and but the top the issues, how, how, to, how to translate it to policy makers, to practitioners, uh, even to the individuals who, are, who we are analyzing. And uh, many, many issues have been dealt with uh, translating to an accessible language, um, the role, important roles of being able to synthesize all our findings, uh, who to contact, who to contact, who is the relevant actor to contact. Sometimes it's uh, more difficult to, to find than, than expected. And, uh, and of course, uh, just to, to end, the importance of making simple recommendations that are clear and, and doable in a sense. And, uh, and controversial, of course, from us. And well, as I said before, there are many issues that I hope I have summarized somehow the content of the session. Thank you very much. And a pleasure to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much. But before we end, um, we have some questions. Um, Elena, from other fields. Uh, it's always uh, enriching 
amazing for us. For me, at least. Yeah, it's quite amazing if you say you had no experience before in evaluating, but you mm -hmm. ended up actually evaluating mm -hmm. an initiative. So, should be really proud of yourself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, you have a whole lot of experience in evaluation. So, did you actually learn anything? Uh, actually, should I speak from the point of trainer or trainee? Are you a trainee also, no? Yeah. Yes, as trainee. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to speak from a point of view of a trainer, because I was, tra I was not training the methods, I was just training the general framework of evaluations with my colleagues. But uh, I would like to say that it was uh, very beneficial for me. Uh, although I know a uh, randomized control trial uh, and impact evaluations and, and the principles of those uh, quantitative methods, uh, I must say that uh, it was really uh, very well trained uh, by Tomek. Uh, I, never I, 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 ne I never thought about that uh, this uh, statistical, I would say, uh, or mathematical topic could be uh, presented in uh, such uh, an interesting and funny way. <laughs> uh, so Definitely. it really helped me to find my way to, to quantitative methods yeah. again, and uh, yeah. So I, I was happy, and I could learn a lot from from Tomek. Thank you, Tomek, and I hope uh, there was no tension between us. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I raised the question, that was first because what was it was on the, uh, on Juliet's list of questions. <laughs> And the second, I wanted to come to the conclusions which we came to the conclusion yes. that uh, those uh, quantitative and qualitative methods uh, are irreversible and they are complementary. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Um, Kinga, how was it for you? Um, I guess you're also in your yeah. department is impact and evaluation, policy and impact evaluation. Yeah. So I guess you have a lot of experience. But did you learn something new? What was your key take home? Of course, it's always great to, because when people are working in evaluation, it's doing, 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 and uh, sometimes it's great to have more theoretical discussions about what we are doing. Uh, that's for one thing. Uh, and another, or for my main takeaway from, from the time of the trainings and when we were formulating the, the methods for the evaluation was that how hard, uh, how how to how to create a universal evaluation method for because very early on it, it could be seen that there are such differences between the countries and the needs and the available initiatives. Uh, so it, it was it was a challenge or, or or it was easy to see the limitations of uh, how universal. Uh, uh, research design or the evaluation design can be so. So it was it was a challenge for us, uh, and it was something that, that we just had to accept that we we cannot create a truly universal evaluation design. Uh, there are not going to be nine more or less identical uh, evaluation where you only have to uh, change the numbers and you can create a quantitative comparison. Uh, but it was something that we had to accept. So it was a um, form of uh, professional um, learning that um, even if there are such variation between evaluations, then you are, to, we were able to create something meaningful uh, out of this okay. pretty, pretty much variation. Thank you. At Tomek. So how did you feel the fact that when we're doing the evaluations, we're doing ex post, so implementing RCTs and uh, more suitable methods was difficult? And how was it also being the trainer of a very different organization, people with background in evaluation, people without? Yeah, and then we can close the round. So thank you, first of all, for many kind words, really. That was so nice to, to hear that. Uh, I was also a trainee. I mean, I learned a lot also from Pat when he, for example, talked about the administrative data usage. I mean, I, I took those lessons and actually used this kind of approach also in 
in other fields. And this entire project and also experience as a trainer was a great lesson for me of the beauty of diversity, uh, both in the content, right, the content we know, it. it's, I mean, the lost millennials, the, it's so nuanced, so diverse, but also the, this team. I mean, that was for me the first time when I worked in so diverse team in terms of uh, different experiences, different fields, different interests, and this was absolutely beautiful to build a common ground about such like hard thing as the evidence uh, evaluation methods to build a community around it and with such diverse um, organizations and people and I truly believe that this project, this is something that I also discussed today even, that I believe this project is somehow a new way of uh, thinking about the, of the network of experts and researchers that are, that are building community for the future evaluations and for the future studies on social issues, not only the lost millennials. So for me it was absolutely great experience to, to talk with, to build a common language, common ground with so diverse um, uh, universe of researchers from different countries and also uh, respect to Esther that she managed us uh, in this very diverse team, that's not easy. And uh, I, I don't understand how she was able to do it, but she was our boss and master. So thank you so much. For that. Okay, so this is a thank you. <laughs> the last one, thank you. It was very nice um, debating or talking with you. And nice to work with you all. I would say yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>